Assalamu alaikum. We're very happy to have everybody join us today. We are gathered today, inshallah, for, I think this is our fifth conference. Is it our fifth, Sad Hussain, or fourth? Yeah, I think it's our fifth women's conference, mashallah. And this, uh, this time around, we picked the, the theme of reflecting the light. And mashallah, I'll, I'll leave it to the speakers to uh, expound on uh, the theme and their select topics. Uh, Stada Hussain Mujaddidi um, is an educator, public speaker, author, writer, spiritual counselor, and mental health advocate with over 25 years of experience serving the Muslim community. She is co-founder of Muslim uh, Health for Muslim, Mental Health for Muslims, a site dedicated to providing mental health-related content uh, tailored to Muslim, uh, the Muslim community. She also produced an author. She's also a published author of a children's book entitled Clear the Path, a rhyme book on manners for little Muslims. So this is our second speaker and second published author, mashallah. Um, uh, well, actually, because copy the, copy the, so Stada Shemira, we need a book, we need a book. Uh, mashallah, it's a really nice rhyming book. Um, so she writes, she edits, she's active content creator on social media. If you're not following her, if you're, the only reason you're allowed to go on Instagram is to follow Stada Hosai, mashallah. Uh, she's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and one of the lone soldiers on Clubhouse, mashallah. She teaches uh, weekly classes on Islamic studies, logic, and critical thinking to middle schoolers and Tejweed to college students. She also offers monthly halakas for teens on contemporary issues and year-round classes on spiritual development and self-development for adults and youth through different local and national organizations, including the MCC. Um, so we're, she's a wife and mother of two and resides here in the Bay Area. Um, if you want to learn more about Stada Hosai, you can visit her website, hosaimajadidi.com, and then um, you can follow her on social media uh, at Hosai Mojo, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Ustad Shamira woke you and I will likely put you to sleep. <laughs> I am really tired, so I'm going to ask for your forgiveness ahead of time. But mashallah, following you is so difficult. No, really, because mashallah, she's amazing. I feel like, you know, have you seen those pictures of like these uh, spider webs? You know, there's some of them that are kind of just messy. And then there's these gorgeous ones. And that's how I imagine Ustad Shamira's brain, I'm like this gorgeous web of intricate just tangents and just design. But everything comes full circle. You just do it so beautifully. May Allah increase you and protect you and preserve you. Alhamdulillah, ameen wa ajmain. It is an honor to be with all of you here today. And um, I want to thank, again, the Rahma Foundation and all of you for um, for being here and for supporting this incredible organization. This is, as Ustada Fadwa mentioned, our fifth installment of the series. And mashallah, each time we've come together to spotlight um, incredible women in our tradition. But I'm going to veer into a different direction today, similarly to what Ustada Shamira presented in terms of this concept of reflecting, right? So I'm actually going to share some reflections. I'm going to reflect on reflecting righteousness. And I'm going to start off as I love to do. I'm a teacher. I like to teach. So I like to look at words and what they mean. So if we look at this word reflect, you know, Webster's, you can look it up, but I'm specific. I'm, I'm, I want to actually focus on on specific definitions here. There's many of them. You can, there are expanded definitions, but here, to make manifest or apparent, right? And then reflection is to, the production of an image by, or as if by a mirror. So I want you to keep in mind those concepts, right? To make manifest or apparent, and then this concept of a mirror, because it's very relevant to our experience as believers and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks of us. Here in uh, chapter Surah Al-Hajarat, uh, Ayah 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, humanity, he's speaking to all human beings, right? Indeed, we created you from male and female and made you into peoples and tribes so that you may get to know one another. Surely the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous among you. Allah is truly all-knowing, all-aware. So to make 
to, to become known to one another, but also in order to do that, you have to make yourself known. And this is one of the great gifts of our uh, tradition, especially for us as women, is that by wearing our hijab, whether you wear it all the time or not, you know, and I've given uh, a talk on this subject before, but I really encourage you to not fall into this black and white type of thinking that I have to, I, I have to either be a hijabi or don't, not a hijabi. Don't do that. Just wear the hijab, embrace it. It is a beautiful symbol and it's an act of devotion and worship. But also one of the gifts of the hijab is that we recognize one another, right? How many times have you been somewhere and maybe you didn't feel safe for whatever reason, right? But then subhanAllah, Allah brings someone around the corner and immediately you're like, oh, alhamdulillah, my sister, she's here. She came to bring me relief when I was feeling something, right? So we get to know one another through this beautiful gift of hijab and you don't have to, as I said, fall into this binary of I either identify as a hijabi, I'm using specific words, or I don't. No, just wear the hijab, just like with prayer, pray, do dhikr, it's all access, we have full access to it, all of us. And many people actually by doing that, slowly, they never want to take it off and inshallah that's the goal. He now speaks specifically to the Prophet Sallallahu and also th through him th to us. He says, tell your wives and daughters and the women of the believers, inshallah, that includes all of us, to draw their cloaks over themselves. Thus, it is likely that they will be known, right? So this is specifically what I was re referencing. So we are a parent to one another. And this is the gift, again, of reflecting our faith outwardly. Mirror, remember, that was part of the definition. It's one of my favorite hadith, right? The believer is a mirror to the believer, right? Al-mu'min, al al mu'min. Some of you have heard, you know, stories that I've shared over the years, but the one that always this hadith reminds me of is the story at the airport. And if you haven't heard it, I'll quickly tell you. I don't want to bore you, but I'll tell you because it's a good reminder. This is when I was waiting for someone many, many years ago. And I used to dress a certain way that I thought fulfilled my uh, identity at that time. And I was very, very focused on the outward. So I dressed um, in all black and I wanted to look very intimidating. I had certain very strange ideas. May Allah forgive me. <laughs> so I'm at the airport and I'm, you know, sitting, waiting for my ride. And I want to kind of, you know, I'm doing the typical thing that you do, you people watch, but I'm also sending a message, you know, like I'm not scared of you, I'm not, whatever it is I'm doing, I'm doing it. And then subhanAllah, this car pulls up and this woman comes out and she is not, she's scantily dressed. She's not dressed modestly. And of course, you know, I, I just started immediately judging her. I looked at her and I was like, Allah, look at her, you know tank top, shorts, what is this, you know, all these thoughts came to me. And I'm just sitting there and subhanAllah, Allah in his perfect timing and his perfect wisdom, she puts, she was getting something out of her, the trunk of her car, she puts the trunk down and she looks directly at me across all these people and I see her at full eye contact and then she just starts to beeline to me, she walks to me. And at this point my heart is like racing, like what's going on? <laughs> You know, was she in my mind? I don't know, maybe. But she comes and she stands right in front of me. And she's so humbled. She's, she puts her head down. She, she's not looking at me now. She just kind of head down, hung low. And she's like, Salaamu Alaikum. Okay. Not the words at all I expected to hear from her. This is an American, white, average, blonde, Californian woman. I'm not thinking she even knows those words, let alone saying them. And then she proceeds to tell me she's embarrassed that she's dressed the way she is. And she is Muslim, but she would, you know, she saw me, subhanAllah, look at her state. She saw me and she was so happy because she felt it was like a sign that Allah wanted her to come and meet me and ask me. She has a son who she's raising Muslim. She wanted resources. So we start talking. And the entire time I am filled with, disgust in myself because I just had all these horrible thoughts about this person and Allah sent her to me 
with such humility. So to me, that single event was the mirror that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reflected to me, to, for me to see my inward ugliness. Whatever I judged her for her outward whatever display, my inward ugliness was far worse. And alhamdulillah, that was a huge turning point for me spiritually. So this hadith reminds me of that. And this is why it's so important that when we see each other, we see each other as mirrors that are reflecting. And that's why we have the beautiful sunnah of smiling, right? This is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because we want to reflect, as Ustad Shamir beautifully, beautifully elucidated, the light of faith. And we do that through prophetic character. We do that through receiving people with pleasant faces. So it's very important to, to do that and also to remove burdens, right? How many of you have ever been low in a low point and someone just by their smile, they uplifted you, right? And you just felt instantly transformed because even whatever was going on at home, maybe your health wasn't well, but someone's energy, mashallah, I mean, we just experienced it with Usada Shamira. Right? She just she has that ability to just wake people up. But people can do that. People can transform. So we're mirrors of one another. And it's a very important concept to internalize. That when you're out and about, that you see yourself with that capacity. And to be honest, I, I, I feel like it's such a gift when you really think about um, what outwardly displaying your faith does. It not only reminds you to be better, but you're also inshallah, serving as a reminder for other people. And these are the types of rewards that await us on the day of judgment that most of us will have no idea about. Because we're doing all these things unknowingly that Allah is so generous, he's taking it to account for us, just you know, guiding people. There are people, and I'll tell you, this is a kind of an odd story, but it's still something to share. When I was in college, because I was, um, when I wore hijab, it became you know, kind of buzzworthy. And years later, I met a friend from college who was Sikh. She's not Muslim, but she, she had a turban on. And she said, you inspired me to wear my turban. <laughs> and I thought that was amazing. You know, I didn't, you know, she just saw me wearing my hijab and she started looking into her faith. And next thing you know, she's wearing her Sikh turban. So, uh, you know, alhamdulillah. But this is the, uh, you know, capacity we have, inshallah, to help ourselves and help other people. If we go to the next word of the title of my talk, which is righteousness, this is also a very important word to understand. This is specific, right? The words here that I've highlighted really do bring us back to the, the divine law, morality, to be upright. And this concept of righteousness uh, in our tradition is, is something that we also need to understand in terms of the terms that we hear, because there's a lot of terms that are interchanged often when we're talking about this concept of righteousness. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى So these two words specifically, bir and taqwa, are what we need to understand in order to have real clarity about what it means to be righteous, right? And they work uh, beautifully. They're complementary to each other. How? Is according to the scholars, albir is the comprehensive term or phrase for acting upon everything which Allah loves and is pleased with, right? From the outward and the inward actions. That's bir. So when we do things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, we're showing bir, we're showing piety. And then taqwa is the comprehensive phrase for avoiding everything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dislike from the outward and the interactions. So they're both needed in order to be righteous. We have to act, and that's why even in the Quran they're often paired together. We need bir and taqwa. And again, here's another reminder, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a beautiful reminder because all of us have to ask. I love, if I mean, I wish, I don't know if there's a list, maybe someone knows of all the questions Allah poses us on the in the Quran. But I really think that is a wonderful way of interacting with the Quran, is finding maybe someone can do that. Any, any, any students here want to take that project though? Um, but to take all the questions out and just see them as an aggregated list so that you can examine the questions that we should be asking ourselves that Allah wants us to ask, because he's asking us, right? He's asking us, will you enjoin piety upon mankind? 
and then forget yourselves. While you recite the book, do you not understand? I mean, this, is, this should put some fear in all of our hearts because a lot of us, we'd like to you know, correct other people, police other people, right? Um, I mean, we can ask our husbands. They'll tell you that right now. I'll, my husband will be the first to say, yeah, you're the, you're the police in the house, you know, correcting him. Why are you doing this? Why'd you put this there? We like to correct a lot, our children, you know, our siblings, any uh, older siblings in the room, you know who you are. I'm, I'm in the middle. I have one younger sibling who doesn't even listen to me. So I get piled on a lot from older siblings. But we like to correct others. And then when do we examine ourselves, right? So this is why these verses are really important because Allah is asking you to examine yourself, right? So how do we then achieve this concept of taqwa. How do we get to the place of bir and taqwa, this right concept of righteousness, excuse me? Three things. I wish this was, uh, you know, in a, in a way that I could, um, like, reorder it, but it, it goes in this order. I was like, ARC, ARC works, but it doesn't. So ACR is going to be the acronym for this. Try to remember ACR. ACR, ACHRA, I don't know. What can we come up with? That? But what is? Uh, what are the three components of achieving righteousness? First is action. It's very important that we call ourselves to be people of action. We are not people of just words, right? We're not people of words. We're people of actions. So we must take action to move away from, and I'm going to get to this specifically. Each one I'll, I'll expand on a little bit. But we have to have action to move away from what? Three things that destroy us spiritually. Doubt, distraction, and despair. These three things. Also, you know, I like alliteration. So DDD, right? Um, these are the things that take us away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to be people who move away from these three things. And I'll get to that in a moment. Knowledge. We are a deen of knowledge. Blind uh, faith is not acceptable in Islam. You have to, and I read this recently, it's not enough to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very powerful. Because if you just believe without actually really examining, right? Because he calls us to look, pay attention, look at the signs. Then you'll come to confirm that belief. But if just believing because your parents told you uh, or whoever told you is not enough for the, uh, for the believer. So we actually have to learn. And then uh, we have to learn about our faith, our creator, and our purpose. What are we doing here? And then we have to obviously act upon what we learn. And then reflection. So this idea that is informing the theme of this whole program of reflecting is also part of our responsibility as believers, right? That we openly and outwardly act upon our knowledge to keep ourselves accountable and reflect the light for others. So this, these three are how we do it. So how do we do this specifically? The first one, right? This is from a hadith where uh, Ibn Umar, may Allah please, be pleased with him, he said that the servant will not reach the level of true righteousness until he leaves what wavers in his heart. So this is why if you're having doubts, you it's on you to seek and ask those, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask those who know. You can't just sit and, uh, you know, be okay with that. And I recently had this incident with someone who was having um, some doubts. And we, we, you know, I explored it with them and I, I, I gave them answers. And they said it was sufficient. And then a few weeks later, they came back and expressed the same issues. And I said, well, I thought you said it was sufficient. And they said, well, you know, I didn't want you to be frustrated with me. And I said, astaghfirullah, I would never become frustrated with you. I would want to help you. But you can't be okay with just sitting with those types of doubts because that's where you give the uh, inroad to shaitan to come and monopolize, right? He's the waswas, he's the whisperer. He comes when you're having a seed and he will fla he will water it. He will pour on that seed until it flourishes into something that really now causes you uh, a crisis of faith. So that's why you have to nip it in the bud right away, seek 
without people uh, who can answer those questions. And don't ever lose conviction. The answers are there. We're, di- we're insufficient. Like I will tell you right now, I don't have all the answers. But our deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it, is perfected. It is complete. That means there's nothing that's missing. The Prophet said, and all the prophets completed their mission. It's part of the the, uh, the the responsibility of the prophets that they give you the full entirety of the message. They completed the message. It's perfect. We uh, are limited, but we can at least do our best and find the answers, inshallah, just through, uh, you know, through our connections and networking. But don't let shaitan convince you otherwise. So it's on you, though, to move away from it and also with despair. If you're in a state of sadness over something that has happened in your life, you've got to remember this life is temporal and, and uh, despair is forbidden. We cannot become hopeless. Mm-hmm. We cannot become hopeless because when you're hopeless, what you're doing is you're showing a lack of confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change your circumstance. And there are people who have been through horrific, atrocious circumstances who are walking with smiles bigger than many of us can maintain. How does that happen if it's not for the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They've been through loss of everything that you can imagine. And we don't need to look beyond our Prophet to see the possibility of a heart that is strong with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah can change their circumstances. So never let despair and depression sink you down. And then distraction. This is very important because we are in the age of distraction. This is the age where our minds, our hearts, our every minute, you know, I was uh, speaking to someone recently about these phones. They're so intrusive. It's so difficult to have like a clear, organized thought, right? How many times have you planned something, but then you get derailed because, oh, ding, 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 ding. So we've got to accept that there's too many distractions. And that's why you have to hold on to the things that help you to get out of distraction. Number one being prayer. Your prayer is literally like, you know, imagine uh, you fall asleep at the wheel and then you get a splash of water on your face, right? That's dunya. Dunya is like we're constantly falling asleep in terms of distraction, in terms of just forgetting our focus. And the prayer is, it wakes you up. It sobers you up. Like, wake up and remember. You're not here for, to eat and drink and listen to music and watch TV and, and socialize all day. You are here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to uh, hold on to those things that break our, our, our minds from the distractions of the dunya. And what that will do when we're actively doing this, right, this is where action is so important, being proactive, is we will, inshallah, increase in our knowledge, which will increase our certainty and our conviction, right? And this is, this is the, the path, inshallah. So that's action. Now, knowledge is also important because we, we talked about, you know, the, what, it, what, it, uh, what, what is taqwa in, in its essence, but what is knowledge of the, of the muttaqi, of the one who believes and who has these beautiful qualities? This verse again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surah al-Baqarah is teaching us, and I love that he starts off with what it, what it isn't. It is not piety to turn your faces towards the east and the west. Very powerful, subhanAllah, because what is, I mean, there's, uh, you know, I, I, when I first read this, I was thinking, subhanAllah, you know, of, of the, you know, the end of prayer, you know, what do we all do? We give our salam. So I just thought, okay, this is like this reflexive act that we're all doing. We're all very, you know, proud of ourselves, very happy with ourselves, which is, by the way, one of the dangers of the nafs is whenever you get content, too content. But sometimes we think, oh, I'm doing, you know, the bare minimum, I'm praying, I've got my base is covered. So you get too comfortable. Um, but then I read the tafsir and it was specifically referencing the, the Christians who prayed toward the East and the, and the Jews who prayed toward the West. And I'm sure there's more opinions. But anyway, either way, he starts off by telling us what it isn't. It's not pious to um, turn this way and that way or to basically outwardly do certain things that we may find ourselves uh, proud of. But rather, what is piety? We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the last day, the angels, the book, the prophets. We give wealth. Look at the qualifiers here. Despite loving it, right? When you give that which you love, it's, this is taqwa, right? 
because it's hard to give away things that are nice or money. We, we want to hold on to it. We're scared. And this is where shaitan is, uh, he, he, you know, incites a fear in the heart of the believer by, through poverty, right? This is uh, one of his tactics. So you give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if you love that which you're giving. To who? To your family, to orphans, to those who are um, in, in difficult circumstances, travelers, beggars. And then the one who performs their prayer and gives the, uh, the alms. I'm sorry, there's, a, there's a, a typo here. And those who fulfill their oaths when they pledge. And those who are patient in misfortune. This is also, this is, these are all qualities of taqwa. So not only are you doing your basic, you know, obligatory actions, but you're also, what? Patient in misfortune, which has to do with, according to the tafsir, it specifically has to do with loss of wealth or struggles with wealth, that you're patient. And hardship, which, has, which is referencing health issues. So if you are dealing with financial struggles or health issues, these verses are speaking to you, that you're patient. And then moments of peril are when there is like war or any, uh, you know, a meeting of the enemy. There's more uh, on that specific um, definition or term. But it is the, they who are sincere and it is they who are reverent. So these are the qualities of a person who has this this uh, concept of righteousness, right? Bir and taqwa. And here they are in an organized list for you if you like lists, which I love lists. So, um, and again, forgive me for the typos. I actually have two copies of this presentation and I realized I edited the one that I did not send to. <laughs> uh, so there you go. That's what happens when you don't sleep enough. Um, so, but here they are, right? The beliefs and the actions. And this brings us back to that second quality, right? Which is actions are the first uh, thing that you need to have taqwa, knowledge, and then the last one, which we'll get to, is reflection. But this is a quote that I, I was reading um, this document, which was really fascinating. I can't wait to finish it. It was long. But it was um, a Christian uh, document, and it was really dealing with the modern world and how Christians have lost their way. And it was, I think, published in the 80s, but they were dealing with some of the things which I'll get to in a moment relating to post-modernity. So they wrote this, and I said, this is so relevant, because for, you know, this program was designed for the youth as well, so I'm really happy to see a lot of the young uh, teens, uh, girls in the room, but I love this message because I saw myself reading this. You know, when I was your age, I was very zealous. You know, we, we zeal, the zeal of youth makes you want to just act, and you just want to be active, and we were, I was doing so many crazy things when I was in college, like... You, the stories are actually, I'm so glad the internet was not around. <laughs> it was just, oh, lie. No, I, sometimes I swear, I'm like, thank you a lot. Because nowadays, like, imagine you do something and then people have a picture of it and it's like on your record for life. Um, so anyway, but the things that, some of the things I did, like just protesting and being very, very active. But the warning here, especially in the second quote, let's just read it actually. Many of the important world-changing movements in history were started by teenagers and young people. So those of you who are youth, heed this warning. And that's because they're still fresh enough and idealistic enough to believe that the world can be changed. Right? You get to our age, you're kind of like looking at the exit door. You're just like, I'm out. I'm just... We do our best, but I um, can't wait to get out. But with you guys, mashallah, you still have hope. So alhamdulillah. But here's the warning. If you're going to change the world, you had better be informed about the issues before you change it and have an informed commitment to changing the world and not just a youthful zeal that is without knowledge because action without knowledge actually leads to darkness, which is the opposite, right? We want to reflect light. We don't want to just be acting and that's what this culture does is it activates people with zero basis of knowledge or purpose and you just have all these people that are emotionally just triggered and dysregulated looking for something to as an outlet to get those emotions out that's not our tradition our tradition is a tradition of knowledge first and foremost you'll get to the action but you better work yourself first before you start dictating to the world right so just a really great reminder and why do i mention this well I'll get to, sorry, I have more to say on that, but this is also another important uh, concept in terms of reflecting, right? So there's many things that we could do, but my brain, you know, I like, as I said, lists. I feel like the simpler the message, the easier that we can retain it. So just, if you can work on these four, all of us, if we can work on these four things, we're good. Inshallah, we're good. Perfect our salah, 
have a relationship with the Quran where we never, and I, I wish, can we just do that now? Can we just do that right now? Ya Allah, can we make an oath right now, every single one of us? Ya Allah, I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional because just make an oath to never leave the book of Allah for a single day. Can we all make an aniya right now? Ya Allah, never let me leave your book for a single day. If that means a verse, alhamdulillah. If it means half a page, alhamdulillah. If it means more than that, alhamdulillah. But you have to, this is what action is. Make an oath and stick to it. I will never ever leave the book of Allah. How could we leave the book of Allah? I am mortified when I think of the days that I left the book of Allah. And on the day of judgment, the regret that we will have the most is the hour that we did not remember Allah. We will regret many things, but that is going to be the biggest regret of our lives. And so have a relationship with the book of Allah where you never leave it for a single day. Dua, we have to make the appeal that we want. I hear all the time when I talk to sisters or people, my children, my parents, you know, and we have so much weighing on us about the future and so many fears. Take it to the mat, as they say. Wake up, wake up and cry to Allah. Ask Him to save your marriage. Ask Him to heal you from your burdens physically. Ask Him to bring, you know, your family, if your families are... are uh, fighting or there's problems. Ask him to bring those things. Ask him to guide your children to keep them on haq. We don't know if we're going to be around. You have to think about these things. Ask him, Ya Allah, you can do anything. Just protect them. But make our dua and make that a part of your life that you don't also leave. And then dhikr, being in a constant state of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know that sounds like a tall order, but it's not. Because if you're, as Mashallah Ustaz Shamir said, if you're looking with the divine light, you can't help but see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. You'll see it. You'll see it in the people that He puts you around. You'll see it in every blessing that, that you, you have. You'll just be like, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. And that's why the Prophet said, look at his life. He was constantly in the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's all he saw. We can do that. That's why he gave us these du'as. But we have to want these things, right? So if we can work on these four things, we will reflect, inshallah, the righteousness, that, the light that is in our hearts. And then we can also, and we should also, reflect righteousness in our companionship. The Prophet was asked, which of our companions are best? So look for these companions. If you don't have friends who do this, may Allah bring you friends who do this. I am so grateful for the people that I call my soul sisters, these beautiful people. Sada, Suzanne, who, please make thought that she returns. People who we love. Sada Mariam, from our hearts, like, oh my God, because why? They remind you of Allah. We don't come together to talk about frivolity and idle talk. Nobody's talking about television and music and concerts and handbags. I couldn't care less. You give me a bag from the 99 cent store, it's just as valuable as a Louis Vuitton. I couldn't care less about brand names. Why are we obsessed with these things? So you come together with your sisters, look for people who their appearance reminds you of Allah. Just looking at them, you're like, Allahu Akbar, that person, she reminds me of God, whose speech increases you in knowledge. When they speak, you're like, every time I leave, I, I learned something. That's the kind of friends you want, and whose actions remind you of the hereafter. You see them running around, helping people, serving, doing khair, because you know, as-sabiqun, as -sabiqun, that's who these people are, I want to be like them. That's the companionship. So reflect that, right? Reflect it. The Prophet ﷺ said, a person is on the religion of his companions. Therefore, let every one of you carefully consider the company he keeps. And then Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh said, mix with the noble people. You become one of them. And keep away from evil people to protect yourself from their evils. Now, this is just going to be the closing. I do have a few more slides after this, but I really want to send this message. This was really the... the 
the most essential part of what I want to share, especially as it relates to the youth here. We want all of us should be, as we've talked and heard, to reflect the light of our tr the truth, the single truth, the truth of Islam. It is the single truth. In order to do that, we also have to be mindful of the time that we're in. We are in an era where there is a huge push to privatize faith, to suppress the practice of faith. We have to be the ones who reject that openly. I will not be suppressed. That is why I will proudly, unapologetically wear my hijab. I will proudly say my name. I will proudly greet people the way that our deen teaches us to greet. You can greet non-Muslims with peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Say it. Why not? It's a beautiful gift to give, right? And when we do that, inshallah, we restore the balance. So what do I mean by this concept of privatization of faith? This is a post-modern world. What does that mean? You need to look into post-modernity, but we're in it. It's the world that we're in. It, and what is it? It's this framework that teaches right? That there is no universal truth with a capital T. These are atheists, secularists, nihilists, Marxists, many of them, who deny God. They do not believe that God exists. So what do they believe there for? That we all have little truths. You have your truth, I have my truth. We can all just be in a truth, I don't know, party all the day long. We're just partying up with little truths. No, there's a single truth, right? Um, but they, what they've done is they've created a society in, or a world now where religion is consigned to irrelevance. Like it's irrelevant if you're religious or not. Uh -huh. How does that, how do Muslims exist in a time where this is acceptable or normalized? How can we, I mean, exist, right? We can't accept that. We cannot accept this worldview because religion is literally, every, we are deen. We are not a, it's not a faith that we just, have. It's a way of our life. It's a way of our existence. So it cannot be irrelevant. It is the most relevant and the most essential part of our entire being is our faith, right? All of these other things is what we call the accidentals. Your, uh, the family you were born into, the you know, color of your skin, your height, your weight, your color, all those things are accidentals. You had nothing to do with them. The essential is your heart. The essential is your faith. So the most essential part of us is actually our faith, right? But what they've done is they've privatized faith practice where uh, it's a separation now, right, uh, between the private and the public. And this is something that this uh, philosopher, Christian philosopher, described as a two-story truth. This is what this society has created. And in order to, again, um, normalize the secularization of society, we're seeing massive changes happening. I know we're all shell. I'm sh I feel like I'm shell shocked. Like every time I open the news, I'm like, I get what this now? I, I was already dealing with this and now I got to deal with this. It's happening at such a rapid rate. The, just the decay of our society. But that's in order to do that, they have to force people to privatize their faith in order to secularize the society. So it all works to their agenda. But let's look at this concept a little bit more again, uh, ver visually. Okay, this two-story model of truth. This is a, a two-story house, okay? Just bear with me. I, I was looking for a good image. This is what I found, okay? So there's a two-story uh, building here. The top is where they want our faith to be consigned to, which is not basically grounded, okay? Think of all the symbolism here, right? Facts, um, knowledge, science, reason, rational thought, right? These are verifiable things. They're grounded. So they're on the ground level, right? The physical level. It's, t it's touching the ground because that's, we're in the world of materialists and scientists and, and people who care more about this physical world. So they want us to just keep our ideas because they're, you know, personal, they're uh, non-rational, non-cognitive. There's not much thought. It's all heart, right? And this separation to create this this division that faith is in the heart is actually quite, um, it, it's, it, it sounds nice, right? This, it's kind of purposefully uh, presented that way. It sounds nice, but it's actually quite insulting. Because what they're saying is that we're not, we're not rational thinkers. We can't think if we have faith, right? You're not using any thought. It's all driven by your heart. No, this is why our deen, subhanAllah, maybe they, other traditions that claim could be true. 
But if there's ever, I mean, if, if from all of the world religions, there's no greater emphasis on knowledge acquisition than in Islam. You will not see any other tradition focus more on knowledge and learning and activating the brain than Islam. So we reject this idea that our faith is consigned to the heart. It's in the heart. But it's absolutely a rational uh, thing. It, it, we think about things. We're supposed to anyway, right? We're supposed to be thinking. So we need to really take this seriously, especially for parents and educators, that when we're teaching our children, that we get this message across to be unapologetically proud of your faith. If other people are out there celebrating all the stuff that they're doing, most of which should never be even known to anybody else, why are we being... Uh, or accepting this idea that we have to hide or minimize. Because even, like, you know, if you're, if you're outwardly wearing your hijab, but you feel like you have to minimize your faith and what it means to you, you can't really openly talk about it with your coworkers or your neighbors or whoever, reject that. Be like, no, I will openly talk about it. Because this is how they're getting away with what they're doing. They're making, they're shaming us into oblivion. And other traditions have gone down that path. But our deen is all about outward. We just went through the verses that teach you to be outward and proud so that people can know you. So we don't accept this. And that's why it's a very important message and I hope you're with me here. Now, I'm gonna close. I don't know if you know this story. I love this story. It's so powerful. The parable of the elephant and the blind man. This is a story, I don't know what culture it comes from but it's often used to talk about, uh, atheists will use this to talk about, and some, you know, um, perennialists who kind of have this idea that there's truth in every faith, that religious people are just a bunch of blind people who are like these people touching different parts of an elephant. And that is all that they um, are, are experiencing. So they believe that part of the elephant to be true. So one will, you know, touch the tusks and say, oh, this, you know, it's smooth. And another will touch the trunk and say it's rough. And then the tail. The point is, is they've, this concept comes out of, we're all just blind faith believers, right? That's what they want to categorize all people of religion. We're like these people with blindfolds on. And we all think we have the truth because we're just blinded by this section that we've been given and that's all we see we can't experience anything outside of that so they they create this idea and then that's what they perpetuate whereas again our deen is all about what light it's about knowledge it's about um like the, i mean i just had this little you know image here that i created but this is sister i was like it's so obvious what the solution is right they're all kind of trying to fumble around this elephant not sure of what's going on and the answer is pretty obvious remove the blindfold remove the blindfold and you'll see truth as truth that's the the issue and for us that blindfold is not entrusting ourselves to ourselves don't don't entrust yourself to yourself no matter how smart you think you are no matter how you know what family you come from you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how much you've been practicing, how old you are, how many hajj you've done, how many prayers you've completed, how many Quran you've completed. If you think for even a moment that you can last in this world without the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His guidance, you are on a path to utter darkness. So for us, don't trust yourself. We remove the blindfold and we put our hands, uh, ourselves in, in, in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what being a, a person of taqwa is, is always reliant on their Lord, never getting ahead of themselves, never falling for the, for the spiritual pitfalls and disasters that, are, uh, that so many others go through. And so uh, we don't accept this idea, right, that, that we're all just a bunch of blind believers. No, we, we are turning on the lights, we're removing the blindfolds, we're learning, and for, when you do that, you see the truth. The truth becomes manifest because Allah is so generous that he gives us the, your, the ability to see the truth. And so as the dua that uh, Ustaz Shamira um, left us with, I will also leave with the same dua because we should be calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this beautiful dua from our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who taught us to ask 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for so much light that you're overwhelmed by it. It's overwhelming to you. It's not just turn on one light, flood me with light, bring me from all directions, make me light, turn me into light. That's the kind of utter desperation that we have to beseech our Lord with because this world is dark and it will remain dark. And the only light is the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us again people of light, inshallah. Uh, and we should do this dua together. Oh Allah, place light in our hearts, light in our tongues, light in our hearing, light in our sight, light behind us, light in front of us, light on our right, light on our left, light above and light below. Place light in my side, I think, in my flesh, in my blood, in my hair, and in my skin. Place light in, excuse me, in our soul and make light abundant for us. Make us light and grant us light. Amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allahu Khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar! Jazakallah Khair. All right, mashallah, I'm going to introduce Sheikha Aisha Prime. She's a world-renowned speaker and scholar. She's the founder and executive director of Yantaru Project and currently serving as the resident scholar and curriculum director. Uh, mashallah, she converted to Islam over 20 years ago. She's been everywhere and studied, mashallah. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about a woman, actually, that I, I'm trying my best to model my life after, to be honest. Um, when I read her story some years back, I just, I don't, you know, when you have that, you know, when you read something or you hear something about just like one particular person and you're just like, I just want to be her, right? Like I just, even if I, even if I recognize that I can't be all that, right? I just like, give y'all don't be, just give me a piece of it. And this is the great Nana Asma'u. So Nana Asma'u is the daughter of Sheikh Uthman Danfonio, who was a great, uh, a very great scholar, basically in the late 1700s. And long story short, he was not only, you know, he, he wasn't only a scholar, subhanAllah, when the West talk about him, uh, they say he was just, he was, the, he was like a fighter, that he was a strong fighter. But in reality, it was what is that he that he was the the Khalifa, basically of a very large Islamic empire that had been an Islamic empire actually at that point for hundreds and hundreds of years, and so we don't actually talk about Islamic empires inside of Africa. That's just a whole nother you know we just gotta work on that. That's a whole nother thing. But what happened was is that at that particular time the the base of the Songha Empire, or the Caliphate, sorry was actually closer to West Africa. But the encroachment of slavery, literally, the be, because slavery was introduced, of course, it was coming down through North Africa into West Africa, through the coast, entire, basically entire villages. If you can imagine, like, entire towns. We think about villages, we think small. But in reality, some villages are very big. They're biggest cities that we know them today. Would be completely disappeared. Right, would be completely disappeared. So if we were to look at, let's say, in one year, over the course of slavery, there's more, it's, it's recorded somewhere, uh, somewhere into the tens of millions, right? Tens of millions of people came up missing. In one particular year, basically, let's say out of Gambia, about two million people came up missing. Now the entire population of Gambia is only 2.5 million people, right? So when we talk about the encroachment of slavery, what we're saying is there are people who are stealing folks, kidnapping people in, in mass amounts and, and bringing them to the states. So at this point, there was also, I want you to, to understand what's happening. I want to give you a little bit of that historical context because as a result, it's something that the Islamic Caliphate said we actually have to move the capital of the Caliphate because of the level of, of harm and war that we're fighting on an ongoing basis. Sometimes we think of slavery, we think, oh, they just stole people, that was it. We don't know that they were actually people who were fighting on the forefront to do their best to kind of push back against it. And so they moved the caliphate, and then there was also an internal conflict, to be honest, between, between the Muslims. And part of the internal conflict, and just, you know, we, we have to tell our, is it okay if we tell ourselves the truth of our history? 
Is that okay? Okay, because that you know it's not usually my way to sugarcoat things. But so I want you to understand that the Muslims in West Africa are in a war against basically the, the Europeans from the Portuguese to the British to the basically a, because of the encroachment of slavery. And then there's a war that's happening. Um, we'll just say with some of the northern tribes, not all, but some of the North African tribes against some of the West African tribes because they were some of, we'll just say there were groups of folks that were, that were saying, well, you know, we were warring with you guys. It's okay to, say, to sell you into slavery for a number of reasons. The details of that we can talk about later if you, if you want. <laughs> but the point is, is that he moved the caliphate and there is a war on two fronts, right? Like we're trying to solve an internal conflict, right? While at the same time, we have a very large enemy from the outside. And the daughter of the, uh, basically of the Khalifa, once Sheikh Uthman Damfurio, who was growing up, and when she began, she was in her young 20s. Basically, she herself was also a hafid of Quran. She was considered someone who was a master of Maliki fiqh. She was also a poet, but she decided basically the way that these men are behaving and fighting amongst themselves, I've got no time for it. She literally started a, a woman's movement of her own. Allahu Akbar. And this movement basically is she decided, you know what, because in, inside of that, so you've got this political war going on, inside of that, the Muslim community of some, not all, are debating whether or not women, because of, because of what's happening, should women go out? Maybe we should shut down the girls' schools. Of, because at that time, there, there were very large institutions where women, when girls were memorizing Quran and learning Maliki Fiqh, there was like a, a push. It, it always happens during conflict, political conflict. It becomes a question, maybe uh, we, in order to protect our women, we should keep them at home. Right, that we shouldn't let them go out to the institution out of fear. Nana Asma'u, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to just elevate her rank and expand her, decided I'm not having that. So basically, she began with a group of women in her area. And she said, I, what is that feedback? Right? That far? Make it better? So basically, she started with a small group of women, and she brought these women together, and she was like, listen, this is what we got to do. There are, number one, we have to make sure that women, no matter where they are, understand their deen, that they understand their personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they don't become disconnected from the Quran and their spiritual tradition. We have to make sure that these women know their fiqh because this is also, we're in spiritual warfare. This is not just a political issue. We're in a matter of spiritual warfare. We have to make sure that these women, that their prayers are accepted. On top of that, subhanAllah, she said that what happens in the midst of war is that subhanAllah, the people that are most affected are women and children. So she said, we have to make sure that these women also have their own means of economic empowerment. And they have to know how to do it in a halal manner. They have to know how do they start their own businesses and have their own businesses. And they're going to do it according to fiqh. Not according to we just got to do what we got to do. But they were going to know how to do it so that those women would have tawfiq inside of their affairs. She also said, we know that subhanAllah, she said, in some of these areas that people don't have, you know, people don't actually have access to water. We have to make sure that people always have access to water. That we want to make, we have to still take care of our people because when the caliphate, when the caliphate moves, right, then basically it's like the capital is going, they, they, her fear was like now the capital is going to be that place where people, you know, the elite can also move, but everybody can't move. Everyone can't afford to move. Who's got a tissue for me? I need a tissue. Somebody have a tissue? Jazakat al khair. You know what's happening. Thank you. So she understood that everybody can't move, but also she understood that because of the encroachment of slavery, I want us to think about it for a minute. If you go into a region and you steal the most you steal, basically, let's say, those that could be the labor and the ones who were going to be able to do the work. 
And we're not just talking about the farmers, right? We're also talking about the muscle. We're also talking about the stealing of the army. We're also talking about the stealing of the teachers. We're talking about the stealing of the, uh, of the builders, of the craftsmen. We're talking about those who do construction. We're talking about the doctors. We're talking about the Quran teacher. We're talking about, we're not, sometimes we think it's just one class. If we say we're gonna steal, right? Majority of this place. Who's going to be left? The weak, the vulnerable. Right. And so what she says is, you know, what happens in these situations is sometimes they won't have they won't have proper access to food. We've got to make sure that these populations are still taken care of. And lastly, she said, of course, in these situations, is that if you know if women are having babies. If people are getting sick because of not having clean water, they've got to have access to health care. So basically, she started with a small group of women. And to make a long story short, every time she would go into a village and she would make sure that the, that village would have those five things. She would always come and teach sacred knowledge making sure that they knew their deen properly, they knew, uh, they, they studied aqidah, they would study Malik al uh, She would make sure then that they had some kind of economic arm by which those women would be able to sustain themselves. She would, so then she would also build a school and she would build a clinic. And she then train a group of women who were in that village that she would train them to the point that now I can hand over this project to you. So you don't, if, if they tell you, you can't come into the masjid, you don't have to worry about it. Because your job is to make sure that these women, the women in this particular area, know their deen fully intact. And that they are not dependent upon anyone economically because they know how to sustain themselves. That they have established their own businesses. When it comes to, she looked at, okay, who are the midwives in the community? There's one. Right? If we can train one of you to be the midwife, then your job is to train somebody else and to get an apprentice. So then we're taking care of our own health care. She did that in over 800 villages. I know. Raise your hand if you're like, can I just have a piece of just a little bit, just a teeny bit, right? So I'm like, wait a minute. First, you didn't just train. And in every, in every village she went to, she made sure she left a group of women who were basically who were at a scholarly level that they could then train the other women that they then became responsible to date we still have the we still have that definitely throughout senegal definitely throughout places in nigeria and gambia and mauritania you have places where women have their own centers their own quran memorization centers they study maliki fiqh they have their own what they like a, they call it even they call it a susu in terms of the way they support each other i tell us this to say that a lot of times as women i give you this this story to it's, it's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about having a level of faith, right? And resilience and knowing what is, you, you don't actually need to know it all. And you don't actually need the support of every man in the masjid. I, I, I know, please maybe, you know, so y'all close the doors cause I don't want nobody to get mad. But, in our, you know, sometimes we're so focused on, well, the men won't let me, or, I, you know, the men are holding us back, or the blah, 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 right? Whatever it is, as opposed to let them run their affairs and let us run ours, right? That they are not basically look for the path of least resistance. I'm not concerned, subhanAllah, you as women, you're raising men. You're raising them. So if you want something different, then you make something different. Right? You want a different reality for the next generation? You're the one responsible for that. Trust me. Trust me. So when I think about, subhanAllah, us, like even, you know, all of you are familiar with the Kubasi movement, right? Inside of Syria. Yes? No? Alhamdulillah. Right? What was it? It was a group of women who said, I don't know what these men are teaching. No, am I concerned? But I know where, subhanAllah, the, if, I, if we get to the root of all of them, if I get to the um of the ummah, 
if I get to the root of this force, that's where the change is going to happen. Right? That's where it's going to happen. And we, subhanAllah, in America, we've gotten it, we've gotten it so twisted that we're so we're so busy, and it's funny because on one hand, we understand it. If I say to you the power, the the you know powers with the people, you understand that. But somehow <laughs> you're more concerned about the imam than the people who are following him. When the imam does not actually get any ajr unless the people <laughs> unless he has a jamaat. And if you're contingent, you're if you're in, in contingent. Making your dean contingent upon your infant, something like that. Okay, you know what I'm trying to say, though, right? If you're just pinning your dean on this one person, when you yourself, right? And I see it. I, we're not knowledgeable about our own dean. So if the imam makes a mistake, and he, you know, he's if he salams out in the third rakaat, and you know that they're four, but you don't know what you're supposed to do. You also have a personal responsibility to know your deen. We have a personal, and alhamdulillah wa shukurillah, you have enough teachers inside of your, I'm, I'm actually impressed with you, to be honest. I'm very impressed with you in the Bay. Like, you, you, you can't, you guys can't cry that. We don't have female scholars. You can't cry that. You can't make that claim. You wouldn't be able to say that and be accurate. Right? Honestly, you have teachers who are, mashallah, organizing for you, calling me all the way from the Gambia. Right? You have, you have women who are organizers and you're professionals. Right? Some of you are entrepreneurs, have your own businesses. Some of you, I mean, mashallah, tabaraka rahman, you're probably in this room alone. We probably have about a hundred powerhouses in this room alone. But we have to act collectively. We have to be those women who are saying, I don't know what's going on out there, nor am I really concerned. Right? That I know what's happening in here. I know what I'm 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 I I'm concerned about making sure that we stay consistent. And yes, alhamdulillah, it cannot just be on the, you know, yes, it's on a religious standpoint, it, it's important. Alhamdulillah, I, I want to talk a little bit about the way that we are in, addressing as women. It, I hope y'all don't get mad at me. If you do, it's okay. I love you anyway. How we as women are beginning to address the, what I would say, the incumbent, I don't know. I'm, my English is lacking these days. Make dua for me. <laughs> the encroaching threat. That's what I want to say. That we have a number of threats to you, to your, to your daughters, to, the, to your most basic identity. But are we using the methods of Islam and the prophetic example and the teaching that we've been given in order to address it? And if you are waiting for men, I'm going to tell you a funny story. It's, I, w I wish it was funny, but it's not really. I was at a conference. Let's just say, in the conference, there was a moment of like difficulty. So there was a break, and then it was like, okay, let's huddle up and figure out how are we going to address uh, basically the the conflict that happened in the session. So we came to convene. And as we co were convening, I wasn't in the session. I knew what the session was about. I wasn't in that session for a reason. <laughs> but when it came to convene, they said, can you please come and, uh, you know, help us figure out how we're going to go back 
and, and to address the problem. So I said, Bismillah. In the course of that, someone who is a scholar, graduated with many degrees in Islamic studies, also has multiple degrees, let's say in a in the American uh, from an American academic standpoint, said to me, "The truth is, Sister Aisha, is that we don't have any idea what you women are talking about." He said, "I'm just going to be very honest with you." I said, "Please be." He said, "When you women talk about that, you guys get broken." He said, "I don't know what that broken is." I literally was like, are you for real? He's like, I'm being honest. I don't know what you're talking about. In that moment, I said to myself, I actually then tried to explain it. Then I realized we're depending on someone to teach us the Islamic sciences of the heart that have no idea about, about not just the condition of your heart, but the anatomy of your heart. So we're expecting someone to do heart surgery on us that doesn't even know what is in your heart. What is your heart? How does it work? Immediately, I said at that moment, I need to call all my sisters who study, who are in this work, and say, it's important that just for now, I don't mean this in a bad, I don't mean it in a bad way. It's not a, it's not a, um, a discredit to them. That's, that's not my fear. I'm not worried about that. It's not about a discredit to them. It became a serious charge for us. Sometimes we're looking at somebody else's inadequacy when in reality, you are the change that you're looking for. And so when I think about the story of Nana Asma. She, there's something that you have been gifted with as women. It's, a, it's, just a, it's like a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just adorned you with. That other people just didn't get it. And it's, it's like the, it's literally the filament in the light bulb. That, mashallah, the casing, right? Right? It looks like it's out front. It looks like it's the light bulb. But really, it's the filament inside that makes it work. That's what you are. And so, I go back to say this. When we respond to our circumstances, our societal circumstances... In a, with a philosophy or a methodology that is not consistent with the Qur'an and the prophetic example, number one, we lose credibility. That's the first thing. We lose credibility. And number two, eventually, it's going to harm our own selves. Let me give you an example. In the feminist movement, they rah rah rahed and philosophized themselves out of their own identity. So the whole point initially was to talk about our empowerment as women and to talk about this is my place as women and to fight for the rights of women. That was the point, right? That was the point. But see, when you keep acting out of a way that's not sirat al-mustaqim, that's not a straight path. Now, you're not a woman. The one who was a woman is no longer a woman. She's a birthing person. A chest feeder. 
Anybody can be you. Actually, your womanhood is not that. It's a commodity. We could just change some parts. And then anybody can be you. Not only we just change your parts and anybody can be you. I could just claim it and you must call me that. And your rights that you had that you fought for, whether it be in the sports realm or in other realms, you sold your, you said yourself you were so equal, so same. We were the same, 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 same. Then men say, well, then we're the same. So now we compete and we're the same. So now you're that now men can now men who claim to be women can now compete with you and then say, well, you have no problem that you should lose because I'm a woman too. So going back to what I was saying as it relates to meaning that when we you can you can have actually a righteous intention, but if you don't have the correct methodology for how to address the problem then you'll actually end up with a bigger problem than what you started with. So in our situation as Muslim women, what we did, they, they, they spoke to our pain. They spoke to certain, in, certain injustices that were happening with us. Allah. They spoke to the, to the issues of gender injustice. But because they used a man-made model in order to address the problem, literally in the end, it becomes something that by which we're almost becoming a renegade out of our deen. So when we look at our, when we look at the likes of Nana Asma, what I love about the her methodology. That's just so weird, right? <laughs> but don't worry, we're gonna pray, right? Right? They definitely right. Okay, so the the point is that in the case of Nana Asma, what I loved about the way that she said we need to address the problem is that the first thing is that these women have to know their dean. Right now, at that time, there wasn't a question, and I I actually find this beautifully and uncanny that there there's something that you don't actually. You don't have to tell a woman who's raised in tradition that, about being a woman. Like the thought that somebody else can be a woman for her, that's laughable. But the fact that we are in 2023, somehow thinking that now we are the first people to somehow come up with like this great idea. Is laughable. But we as Muslim women have actually began, right, to even start studying, taking up four or five years of study on something without first having a proper foundation in our aqidah. What If I were to ask you from an aqidah standpoint, who are you as a woman? Right? And if you tell me a mother, I'm going to shout from the top of my lungs. Because our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an was definitely a woman and she never had children. Right. If we look at, you know, Queen Asiya, the woman who raised Musa, who's known as one of the most four perfect women. Right? She never had children. So we are, that's the, the my whole point is that we are, you know, somehow even like we're invested and we're following these and we're down for this and we're following this method and blah, blah, blah. And that's the method I'm going to go. We have mistaken when we talk about re resilience and resistance. We have come to a resistance movement, misunderstanding that our resistance is a resistance to shaitan and the, and the Dajjal and his army and their thinking and their ways and their methodology. That our resistance is a submission to Allah no matter what. That's our resistance. That our resilience is to stand up for this is, you will, you will not encroach upon deen. And you as women, subhanAllah, you're, you're, you are created to be hafidhatul al ghaib. Hafidhatul al ghaib meaning that you are the preservers of the unseen. When we look, Allahu Akbar. I, I, I want you to understand this about yourself because it's so significant. What does it mean for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to name you as the hafidhati lil ghaib? The first thing is that, I'll give you an example. And our mother Khadija, 
right? Or even in the in the mother of Musa, in the mother of Musa, Allah subhanahu wa taala is giving her ilham. He's speaking to her. Wa alhayna ina umi Musa that He's given her revelation that I'm going to inspire you and to protect something, and you're, the way that you're going to protect and guard over it, you have no idea that this is this is about to be serious. Like the mother of Musa is holding a big secret that we don't talk about. The mother of Musa is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry, I'm going to return him to you and I'm going to make him from amongst the messengers. Is that not revelation? But this is this this is the secret that she's holding. And her job is to be a guardian over that which hasn't been told yet. About that which hasn't been revealed yet. When we look at our mother Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and the way that she loves and takes care of and supports the Prophet that Allah put her in that position because of her qualities, because of what she brings to the table. And I'm not talking about her finances. I'm talking about her character. What is she preserving? What is she protecting? She's protecting Rahmat al Alameen. We could go into some of there's so many, uh, so many aspects of what it means. But your this is why even historically, women were known to be the preservers of a hadith. They're known to be the preservers of the prophetic tradition. That's the role we played in society until now. Right? That you are the preservers of prophetic tradition. That the way that someone, one of the key ways to know whether or not a hadith was sound was whether or not it was what there's a woman in its chain because she's never known to be a fabricator to fabricate a hadith. So I just want to say that as we're talking about this, you know, there are a number of enemies that you've got to be resilient over. And I'm sure, Sheikh Samira, you've heard it in this message. What are your four enemies? Shaitan, Nafs, Shaitan, or Iblis. You know, you know Iblis comes from, oh, okay, I'll tell you in a minute. Let's first get to it. So, Dunya, Hubbu Dunya, Love of Dunya. These are your four enemies. Iblis comes from the root word balasa, which means to be hopeless. So one of the biggest things that that how shaitan comes to you and whispers to you is that sense of it's not going to get any better. That sense of hopelessness. They're not going to let us. You know, they're, they're, they just keep pushing me down. They're not responding. They're not listening. As opposed to, why are you even inside my framework? That's the, actually, that's the beauty of women having gendered spaces in Islam. The beauty of women having gendered spaces is for us to understand, you, you are a jamaat. <laughs> you are a power. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik na sayyidina wa habibina munana muhammadin wa alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the biggest ways, and I, I want us to not think it's small, I just I'm I'm gonna emphasize it in ten different ways. Is that our resilience? How do you gain the confidence? You've got to study the women in our in within the prophetic tradition. Subhanallah. You guys are familiar with Nusayba Um Amara, right? For me, that's like the, I just love her. She's like one of my, you know, my great loves. Where Subhanallah, she's she's in the tent of women who are helping the wounded. And the men, subhanAllah, the archers on the mound descend from their position in the battle of Uhud. And she can see the warring army coming from one side and the Prophet وسلم, coming up on the other. Right? And she doesn't say, stand there, come, these men, oh my God, they don't love their position. Let me go run around and tell these men what they need to do. No, she just ran up the mountain. Right? Stood between the soldiers and the Prophet. And she defended the Prophet and saves his life until they realize, oh my goodness, we need to go back to our position.
Why did she do that? Because she's a preserver. <laughs> that who we are is that we're someone who are, are preservers of this deen. And so we can't throw our deen behind our back thinking that we're, that Islam is that which oppressed us and I've got to run towards some kind of anything, liberation of any type that's somehow going to set me free. Trust me, that's going to leave you, shaitan is going to put you in a trap and then sit back and laugh at you. I, I definitely believe he's laughing at us in our current gender politics. You people are so confused, you don't know what you are. And so it becomes uh, incumbent upon us. Number one, I've already said it. Like I said, I'm emphasizing 10 different ways. We've got to come together to study our own dean and become rooted. We've got to know it, like know it, like know it, like know it, like know it. And then we've got to come together and build institution together. All right. And we've got to make sure there's a, there's a care and concern that we have to have for each other on a regular basis. Do you need anything? I know you just had a baby. Let's get this rotation going. Make sure you have food. You know, there should be, definitely, there should be no one in our, in our community that's hungry. I don't think nobody in the Bay is hungry. A lot of people hungry in the Bay? Yeah, they feed, MCC feeds 400 people. SubhanAllah. That's, that's shameful, don't be honest. That's shameful. Like in a place so wealthy, like for there to be people who act, that's, that's shameful. That's shameful. Yeah, so we have to make, alhamdulillah, you guys are organizing, you're feeding people, right? There are people who are involved with that. You want to be involved with that. That's one of the first commandments that the Prophet him gave when he entered into Medina. Give salam and feed people. Right? So alhamdulillah, you, you guys are doing that. But that's, I, I cannot say enough, 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 enough. Even when we're thinking about going into business, when we're thinking about organizing, you you gotta ask, what are the rulings on? How do we how do we do that? How do we do it so that we can be sure we're having tofiq wa afia that we're doing it according to the way Allah and His Messenger have decreed? What are the rules and regulations about that, so that we can have success with dunya wa akhirah? Testing, you know, testing on an individual level. That part is promise. Allah said, he will, you will, did you think that you would be left alone and not be tested? Saying you believe and not be tested, of course you will. Like, that's the part of the, you know, that's, that's a part of the process. You squeeze a lemon, what are you going to get? Lemon juice. If you squeeze an apple, what are you going to get? Huh? Apple juice. If you squeeze a mutman, what are you going to get? Don't tell me mutman juice. Right. You should get, if you squeeze, you should get Iman. <laughs> you should get, like, you know, when it's like, it's something that it shouldn't break you. It should make you. It's like, oh, this is, this is who I'm about to become. I'm about to get to this next level. Right. I'm about to, I'm about to rise to this next level. So it's, it's, sometimes it's our trials that determine who will be. But let's not look at them as something that breaks us as opposed to the opportunity to rise up. Subhanakallahumma wa I don't know what time it is. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. Okay. Her question is like with the Kubasi women, how do we start a movement? How do we do it? So the first thing, even like Nana Asma, they started with a small group of women. And it's women who are committed. So, you know, what I noticed in these situations, like you say, okay, we're going to do a year intensive. And inside of that year intensive, we're going to study Aqidah, we're going to study Fiqh, we're going to study certain verses. Let's just say, I'm going to say some uh, highlighted verses from the Quran. Then you train those women on those particular things. And those verses are pretty much connected, of course, to their ibadah, but also connected to their circumstances. So you train those women. Now, you're going to start out with 40. In the end, you're going to have about 10. It's just the nature of it. Oh, I got this. This is what I have. That's, that's fine. That's, I'm always like, it, does, it just takes a few to make a difference amongst many. So, subhanAllah, you, with that 10, once you train them, alhamdulillah, now they have responsibilities. 
right? Whether it be in a masjid or in a general community. And their job is they need to train at least five, right? Preferably those women are also from other places. So if you did it online, right? Preferably those women are from other places. The other thing is, is that, so that's your women who are knowledgeable. You need to find out also who are the, who are the women in business? Who are the women in finance? Who are the women, who are the, who are the, the money makers in the community? And so really those women have to also be committed. They should have some training as it relates to like, these are like, these are the, um, so there's a really great Sheikh, may Allah bless him. Um, but I think also, yeah, he, they have some, basically the rules around like nonprofit work and, you know, things like that, that also related to business as well. And you start with them a social enterprise and we say, okay, from these, from this group, and that may be larger, they say, okay, we give this, this much together. So in the Susu, what they do, um, in, for example, in West Africa, is the women say, we're going to support this particular business that's run by, that, that'll be run even also by the community. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. You ever heard of an organization called 10,000 Villages? So it's a, But 10,000 Villages is a group of women who go to different places in the in the world. It's a little bit. They're Christian Mennonite women. They're basically they buy different products, fair trade from different that are used. They're produced by different people. They sell them in a store in America. They bought a they bought this for seventy five cents. They sell it for seventy five dollars. <laughs> Just being honest, <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> but, um, but they have a store. They use it actually to run their church. Most people don't know that they're 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 Mennonite. They're they're now also the women who work in the place are a part of that church, and they're just volunteering so many hours or whatever a week. All right, and so then it it becomes back recycled. Now I don't know if they use it for particular causes, but I say then we should use it for particular causes that are specifically related to women. So. What are some of the initiatives you guys have in the community? In terms of, like, like that are specifically related to women. The Qadiyah. The Qadiyah Qadiyah app. Yes. What was it? Oh, yes. Right? Like the domestic violence shelter. And they always need funding. They always need help. So it's like, okay, this particular business venture that we came up with, whatever the model it is that we're selling, that the proceeds from it, at least, you know, of course, you got what you need in order to run it and to pay the employees. But then it, in, in addition to that, we can say this much, 80% or whatever the profits, or we can even say the 100% of the profits once we've taken care of the business side of it, that goes towards the domestic violence shelter. And then repeat. Right? Then you do it as it relates to, to other things. Then you've got, mashallah, you guys have a portion of it already. Like this 10-year program, mentorship program that you guys have been doing here in this masjid with the young girls, mashallah. Like that is, that's huge. Right? That's one of the things that also does it. But then you say, okay, there are a group of, there's some of them who are going to be, who have the aptitude to be hufad. Right? There's some of them, mashallah, who can who can study some fiqh and we can like really train them. So it's like, then we start training them because the truth is, and it can be small. Do you guys, you got Rama foundation. So you just have a, have a, a an elm arm of it. Right. Yeah. And they're just, their whole thing is like their, their job is to make sure that you, they study this Dean and they have, but they have an assignment. Right. So I heard that there are women who actually work together here in the Bay but they're a part of different massages. So now that one of those young women who've just finished, right? Now her job is she's stationed at this masjid and she's going to run this young women's halakha, whatever, 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 for however long. And this one is not going to run this woman's halakha for however long. Eventually, you have a women's movement. Especially if every year you come together, let's say for a, a women's retreat or women's conference. But, and those are the women who are running and they're teaching it. You have a, that's going to spread. Pretty much that's what they did to us in today. <laughs> like in the end, we're majority, at least the ones who were in America. Then you got like Makassid, you got, uh, what is it, Greensville Trust in the UK. They all end up going somewhere and establishing something. Uh, resources, educational resources to learn more about Asma. Oh, no, no, Asma. Oh. 
It was a book. They're, you know, it's so sad. The first woman that um, is known in the in the known the more modern world to write um, a story about her was Jean. Uh, what's her name? Jean Claude something. Jean. Oh, called the she's called the the Cali the Khalifa's daughter. The Caliph's daughter, Jean Boyd. Jean Boyd wrote a book called The Caliph's Daughter. Gives her whole life story. Mashallah. Rabata did uh they have like a feature on there about her like a article about her but if you look her up now she is some it's amazing that now she's becoming more and more and more known um but her project was a very sim the project that we have in the Gambia is called the Yantaru project so Yantaru means meant the blessed collective and it was a, a the collective of women and so it's actually the Yan, the Yantaru uh organization that actually is what you know the, so the collective also has a double meaning also means the sisterhood and so it's these women that you know would go and and do these villages very similar to yeah even subhanallah if we with the organization right like we're talking about from the economic arm if you start a business whether it's an online business rahma foundation i'm just saying rahma foundation decided they're going to sell hijabs online Right, so the proceeds from those hijabs that are being sold online will then actually go. Meaning, she, the masjid doesn't have to give money for that sister to go teach. Right, the sisters who are part of that collective, they pay money for her to go teach. Right, and could be somewhere else. Oh wow, well, I need. To, yes, it can go to Chicago. Like, okay, we're gonna send you. You know, hopefully she'll get married to my name, job in Chicago. But 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 it can be right. <laughs> The thing is, is that we, you know, subhanAllah, you, we, you guys are paying all kinds of, you're paying the imams, you're paying. But if you want a women's, if you want women to succeed and to be able to have access, right, for daughters all over. Because the truth is we need it at this point. We need it. We're, you know, the, um, like even the emotional and gender intelligence. I'm like, you have it. Yes. Somebody had a question. Yeah. The Khalif's sister. Thank you. So Shehu Uthman Demphodio, that's very important. When Shehu Uthman Demphodio, Rahmatullahi, when he passed away, uh, Muhammad Bello became the Khalifa. Her brother became the Khalifa. And so there was kind of like this, you know, big thing. And she, you know, basically when he came to power, then she was like, okay, you run that. Uh, uh, politics, uh, I got to make sure that we have, that the women are taken care of. So this one is a tough one. Let me say this. When it comes to you studying, uh, when it comes to studying, if your husband is not in alignment with you studying, the first thing is that you don't have a choice in that matter because it's a matter of your father's line. So it's your responsibility, it's your duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to study. Now, we do have to make it easy for each other, meaning if your husband is like, I know you can't go to Tareem and go study, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not, that's a, in that case, that's, that's consistent with his right. Like I, you know, for my wife to go study somewhere in Tareem, why? Because I'm going to be away from you and I'm here and come. That's, that's challenging. No, subhanAllah. But he can't say, okay, you want to go online and study with, you know, the Rabata or you've got a sister's Hanukkah or there's something, you know, there has to be some, uh, it can't be just like, you know what, if you you don't want to go with me to Syria to study that's it no come on now um that but however if it's there are more resources that are accessible and available now when it comes to if you're not able to study like for example if there's you know aqidah is not being taught in your region and you need to go to minnesota <laughs> Right, you need to go to Minnesota to take this class, you know, for a few months because it's not being taught. Okay, that's a few months you can do that, you can go. And I know that I'm giving, you know, for the most part, people are like, come on, but you did it, you know, you come on, you went, you went and studied in Egypt, you went and studied in Tadim. And there are a couple of things about that. Number one, yes, I did that, but number, I'm also, I'm the only Muslim in my family, right? And I'm the youngest of eight girls. So there was there I, there was no mahram you know that could take me. Let me say that there was no brother, there was no uncle, um, you know that was going to take me overseas. And at the time when I began studying, I was married, so I did have permission <laughs> to go and study. So that's a different, that's a very different case that I had permission to go study. So Allah yirhamu. 
Any other questions? Uh, Mary, let me also say this. Um, there needs to be a lot of dua in, in Qiyam layl in Sujood, regarding the marriages of our community. Pray for each other and each other's marriages because that's something if you make dua for your sister, it's, it's you know, a dua mustajab, it's accepted. It's also something that is a very, it's, it's a very difficult situation to be in where you feel like I want to study, I want to be more committed to my deen, but I don't have someone who is supportive of that. And that's usually based upon either one or two things, either because that person is concerned and we have to, we also have to take on this concern. Either that person is concerned that, okay, you're going to become knowledgeable and expose what I expose me for what I don't know. So there's an insecurity in your spouse. Um, that's one aspect. The other thing is, is that there may be a fear that, um, and this happens, I've seen this happen, you know, right? We have to tell the truth about this. I've seen women like, oh, get knowledgeable. And then, you know, you're going home like, well, you don't know that, and you don't know you're farther than I. Well, if you studied your aqidah, brother, well, you know, like we we get a little sassy, right? And so it's important that as we study and as we're, you cannot be studying, I'm going to be honest, whatever you're studying, that's, you know, tasawwuf and tasqiyah has, has to be a part of that. Like akhlaq has to be a part of that. Um, because if, if, if ilm made you arrogant, then you missed the point, right? And so, and if, especially if that brother is financially supporting you, I don't know the case, right? I don't know the situation. I'm giving generalizations. But if that person was financially supporting you and it's because of that, you know, that's where you, that's how you eat, that's how you, you know, get your livelihood, then, you know, be be gentle and careful about how, you just disregard or, you know, the sub of the means by which you may be able to study or that's also, you know, because the, the, the haq of nikah is with the woman, right? Allah is just, but the haq of talaq is with the man. So you chose that man. I was your, you know what I mean? You, you made that decision. So yeah, work that out the best you can. <laughs> you gotta go pray on that, suffer with that. You know, most people think I'm no, suffer with that as until, until Allah shows you. There's a beautiful ayah in Surah Al Talaq that I just found it so beautiful. Inshallah, my sister's gonna recite it for me. Where is she? No, she stopped out. But I'm gonna recite, tell you in English. And like Allah talks about the patience and when you have patience, right? Have patience until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a way out. I remember when I, I find it amazing. Surah Tawba. Surah Tawba. Surah Tawba. Sorry. Surah Tawba. And it's about that if you're patient that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a way out. And don't think that that means exactly. Don't think that that means like, oh, I'm about to have, don't think that means of divorce. No. Inshallah, that means Allah will open up his heart. Allah will soften his heart. That Allah will increase him in knowledge and understanding by which that, you know, you studying, you being more religious, me, you being more committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is easier on you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easier on you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our sisters that are having, that are struggling in their marriage especially that are that are struggling in ways by which they want to be more committed to Allah. May Allah, Ya Rabbi, bless their husbands to be more understanding, more compassionate, and increase them in knowledge and wisdom. Allah, Make dua for your husband. Please don't just, you know, we have enough divorces. Make dua for him. May Allah give him hidayah. I'm going to introduce Ustada Maryam Amir, who is the creator of the free app Qari'ah. The Women Could On Reciters app, now available on Google Play and Apple Store. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, she got it down, <laughs> uh, if, you did, if you haven't downloaded this app, this app has, has really transformed uh, so many women's experience listening to and reciting uh, Quran, MashaAllah. Like, it was my companion app in Ramadan. 
you know, like, you know, when you like have a goal, but you can't quite get there, but you have to like, I do a read along sometimes because it helps me like with pacing when I'm yeah. deliriously tired. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my app. Mm -hmm. So, and then they have like the fast reciter, the medium reciter, the slow reciter. So you can choose your favorite. So yes, I'll take the percent of, uh, you know, royalty. No. I was just going to say, she's All free, not paid for this Not ad. paid advertisement or promotion. Much so from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> right. So it's a Q A R I A H uh, and dot app, A-P-P. And uh, we can, inshallah, um, share that. Oh, you don't have your little key. I can't believe I forgot my QR codes. <laughs> it's okay. So, so um, yeah. that's a big thing that uh, mashallah Sada Maryam does. She received her master's in education from UCLA. She holds a second bachelor's degree in Islamic studies through Al-Azhar. She studied in Egypt, memorized the Quran, has researched a variety of religious sciences, uh, tafsir, fiqh, sira, mashallah, commentaries, human rights, women's rights, um, so many things in the last 15 years. She's host of the Quran Champion series on Islam Channel. She has been interviewed by uh, for her work by major news outlets like BBC, NPR, and CBS. Her focus is on spiritual spiritual connections, identity actualization, social justice, and women's studies. Um, all of that has humbled her to get to. F sorry, I'm just fumbling because I'm really we tired. Can just start. Wait, wait, wait. Just one really quick, really quick. Alhamdulillah, about a month ago, I had the honor of being in Masjid al Aqsa. And the Imam of Masjid al Aqsa, he points to kind of like a mimbar that you can see off in the distance. And he says, there is a school there that 20,000 women scholars have graduated from. And they would teach in Masjid al Aqsa. And they would travel to see. Syria, and they would go to Syria and they would teach in Syria. And Masjid al-Aqsa is this incredible, incredible area, subhanAllah, tabarakallah, not a single space of it has not been walked upon by a prophet, not a single space of it, whether a prophet or an angel has not been occupied by that space. This is a land of blessing. This is a blessed space. And in that space, what we see is this history of women scholars, this history of women teachers, like Umm Darda al-Sughra, radiallahu anha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. That that she came and she would teach where the Dome of the Rock now is, inside or outside. And then when her lessons were done, the Khalif at the time would come. He was her mahram. He would hold her hand and they would walk to Masjid al-Qibli where he would lead Salah. Many times when people see Masjid al-Aqsa, there's this like, that's not actually Masjid al-Aqsa. That's the Dome of the Rock. And it's interesting because that's not correct. The Dome of the Rock is one masjid of five that is within the compound of Masjid al-Aqsa. So when you see that other one that everyone says, that's the real Masjid al-Aqsa, that is Masjid, it's called Masjid al-Qibli, but it's one masjid of many masajid within the massive compound of Masjid al-Aqsa. And within this compound, subhanAllah, when Umar radiallahu anhu came into Jerusalem, came to get the keys to Masjid al-Aqsa, to, to Quds, to Quds. The very first time that the Adhan was going to be called in Quds, the very first Muslim to pray in Masjid al-Aqsa after the Prophet wasallam himself had prayed there, when Umar radiallahu anhu takes the keys and he comes in, and then it's a much longer story, but just focusing on the aspect of going into the place of Aqsa, he didn't know where Aqsa actually was because at that time, what happened was the Christians who had ruled previously, remember Surah Al-Rum, Surah Al-Rum, Surah Al-Rum, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are going, um, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to, uh, he, he prophesizes, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's telling them, he's telling them that the, Rum, the Romans have been defeated, but they're going to get it back. They're going to, def the, they're going to defeat the Persians. And this is like shocking at the time. But, what happened is the Persians had destroyed this area of Masjid al-Aqsa. Then the Christians came and they were not respectful of the area of Masjid al-Aqsa. So it had been turned into a dump. Masjid al-Aqsa was a physical dump. It was a place in the space of time where crusaders would keep it as a pig pen. It was a place where you can still see the markings of the crusaders where they would latch their horses to the walls because they would keep it like a stable. So this area when Umar radiallahu anhu comes in, he doesn't exactly know where's the actual like Play spaces of worship. And so one of the companions who used to be Jewish, who had converted to Islam, showed him, radiallahu anhu, where? And then he asked Bilal, radiallahu anhu, to make the adhan. 
Now Bilal had been the Mu'addin of Medina, but he had left Medina after the Prophet wasallam passed away. He used to make the Adhan in Medina, and then the Prophet wasallam passed, and he couldn't bear to make the Adhan in the city where the Beloved wasallam was resting, where the Beloved wasallam asked him to make the Adhan, and when he would come upon the name of the Prophet wasallam in the Adhan, the, the pain of the entire city and hearing the adhan it was so different after the loss of the Prophet wasallam. So Bilal عنه, asked for permission to leave Medina. And he was going with a group of people, including Ubadah ibn Swamit, and he was part of the Fath of Al-Aqsa. And when he was part of the Fath of Al-Aqsa, and Umar asked him to make the adhan, initially he said no. And then Umar عنه, encouraged him, saying if the Prophet وسلم, was here, he would want him to make the adhan. So Bilal radiallahu anhu made the adhan. And when he made the adhan, radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu just fell to his knees sobbing. It was the first time the companions had heard the adhan from Bilal radiallahu anhu. But can you imagine that now it's in Masjid al-Aqsa? Can you imagine that now it's where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led all of the prophets? Can you imagine that this is a space where the angels have been and the angels have come and Angel Jibreel alayhi salam gives the revelation to Maryam alayhi salam that she's going to become the mother of Isa to Zakaria alayhi salam that he has been he has answered in his dua that he's been making and making. SubhanAllah, this space is where Um Haram bint Milhan, the companion radiallahu anha, was with her husband Ubadi ibn Swamit. Ubadi ibn Swamit is buried right outside of the wall of Masjid al-Aqsa. So if you go to the compound, there are graves on one side, um, outside of the, of the compound, and you can go, his grave is literally at the wall with another companion, Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhuma. When you go to see Abad ibn Swamit radiallahu anhu, he is buried right at the wall where Masjid al-Aqsa is. This was one of the first scholars and judges of this whole area in Philistine. This is just the opening the fetch of this area. And who was with him? Um Haram bint Milhan radiallahu anha. So when we talk about 20,000 women scholars who graduated, 20,000 women scholars who taught in Aqsa and went to Syria, think about where that tradition began. It began with the woman companions themselves. Why? Because the Prophet wasallam took a nation who would bury their daughters alive and mentored them to learn from women as their teachers. So Umm Haram, she was actually a relative of the Prophet wasallam, and it could have been through blood lineage or it could have been through rudaa. It might have been because um, of the way that they would have the nursing system where if, uh, if, if, if there's, there's lineage that's established when people nurse each other's children. And so the Prophet wasallam would go and would sleep at her home. This is his, his aunt. And it wasn't just her. She also had a sister, Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha. And their stories are so powerful because of who their personalities were and because of the fact that they were so intentional despite the hardship that they faced, the resilience that they showed, and the intentionality of their worship as women is one that subhanAllah we see the Umm Haram was there when the Prophet ﷺ woke up smiling from a dream. He had this beautiful dream. And she asked him, What's, what are you, why, why are you smiling? And the Prophet ﷺ had fallen asleep because she was massaging his hair. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was looking for something in his hair. And can you imagine the Prophet Sallallahu carrying the message of Islam, carrying the worry of the whole Ummah, worried about his own family members, worried about his own daughter, losing his own son, losing every single one of his children except for Fatima radiallahu anha, and then going to who is like his aunt and just relaxing. It's like spending time with his khala, just having that moment of peace and security. And so he is with her. And when he is with her and she's going through his hair, combing through his hair, looking for things in the hair, he falls asleep with that kind of like hair massage, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he has this dream and he wakes up smiling. And when she asks about it, he tells the dream, which is a prophecy of what is going to happen, that these companions, that they're going to be riding on the ship, that they're like kings. And she asks to be a part of this group. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't respond with, no, it's enough for you to stay home. The Prophet Sallallahu doesn't respond with, don't you know the fact that you're, you have a prophet falling asleep, taking naps in your home is enough for paradise for you? The Prophet Sallallahu response wasn't, well, you have responsibilities to your husband and your children. The Prophet Sallallahu response was, you will be with them. And another narration making dua for her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have other narrations of mothers 
coming and asking about their reward. And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that their reward is in taking care of their home, is in taking care of their children, is in taking care of their husband. Every single woman companion had a different lifestyle, life reality, personality, life objective. And what's so powerful in the seerah is that we see that their aims for Islam were appreciated by the Prophet ﷺ. Whether it was the Banu Ghifar tribe, the woman of the Banu Ghifar tribe coming and asking to help nurse the wounded, and, and, and the Prophet ﷺ at the Battle of Khaybar saying, with the blessing of Allah, giving them the blessings of coming, or in another circumstance where it would be better for a woman to pray in her home because of the dynamic she had with her husband. Every single person's reality was reflected in the society of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's an obligation upon us as women, really, to mirror the nuances of that dynamic so that we don't have young women who go into a masjid space. And many of us, alhamdulillah, are blessed with MCC here. And some, some of you asked the question in the other session. We do have a, a couple of amazing masjid, alhamdulillah. But what about all those masajid that don't have that example and where we don't feel like we can have a space and where our daughters grow up or our sons grow up not seeing that as what should be normative access? What about for them? And the message when someone grows up in that way, not knowing that Islam is actually for every single one of us, no matter what we are going through, the resilience that we're showing, inshallah, that really can shift the way a person has their relationship with Islam in general. And I get messages like that every single week. And those of you who are from the generation of mothers and grandmothers in this room, I'm seeing you nodding your heads. And maybe you've seen that in your own lives. Maybe you've seen that in the lives of your children. Maybe you've seen that in the lives of, of your peers whose grandchildren are making a different decision. And it's a very difficult one to acknowledge when we see that there could be a different reality if we were to mirror the society of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umm Haram radiallahu anha, she wanted to go on this expedition. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she taught us a statement from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the best jihad for a woman is what? What is it? No, but nice, very nice try, may Allah bless you. Louder. Not a, no, but very nice try. Hajj, Hajj, it's Hajj. The answer is Hajj. Um, but I love that mo multiple people said taking care of the family. That is a jihad first. May Allah bless every single one of you in every single way. Reward you all and the men and all of our ummah. Ameen. And so Aisha radiallahu anha learns from the Prophet sallallahu this narration. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passes away, Aisha radiallahu anha wants to make Hajj again because of this narration. Because of the strength of this narration and her seeing that it is the best type of worship for women. So she goes with the women, uh, the mothers of the believers, not all of them, but the majority of them, wanted to go for an extra hajj. Because Aisha radiallahu anha had already made hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the obligatory hajj. And what happened to her when she went? Yes, she got her period. And what did she do? She cried. She sobbed. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw her, he comforted her. He connected that moment of pain for her to a prophet, her great-grandfather, Adam alayhi salam. And what? He taught her the rights of how to make hajj in this circumstance. Her sharing that narration is a gift for all of us until the end of time. And subhanAllah, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, he was in a circumstance in his time period where he had to make a fatwa for what women should do when they are on their periods in Hajj and they can't finish Hajj before they leave. Before the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, there was a political, uh, there was political support for Hajj, which meant that the ruler or the rulers of the area, they would have Hajj caravans go out to meet the Hajjaj on their way back. So you're, you're going through the desert for days, months, almost a year, depending on the place that you're coming from. And there are bandits in the desert. You don't have water and food. So they had these caravans that would meet the hedge caravans. They would meet them on the way, and they would provide for them the, the provision that they needed and the protection. Because if you're constantly meeting caravans, there's less of a chance that there's going to be some sort of bandit coming through and trying to take your provision or even murder some of the individuals on the caravan. But during that time, the ruling class shifted. And they no longer put 
the, the, the policy of protection for the Hajjaj. That was suddenly gone. And so the Hajjaj who would come into Mecca and the woman who used to stay longer with their caravan to complete Hajj after their period, these caravans started to leave immediately. And they were scared because if they're going to stay to complete the Hajj, just because they're on their period and it's only going to be one caravan of their relatives or just a few people, that's not enough protection in the desert for months at a time sometimes. And so Ibn Taymiyyah looked at the reality of women and individuals losing their lives and their property because now they are stragglers on their own without the state's protection. And so he made a ruling that he said he hit the people before, the scholars before him didn't even have to think about this issue. It never came up for them. But now he made a ruling that if a woman is in Hajj and she's on her period or Umrah and she's on her period and she's not going to finish before she leaves and you can't always wait for Hajj groups to, to wait for you. And also, realistically, it's extremely expensive to delay for another week. Not everyone has that type of financial capacity. You can't always leave your children for another week or your job for another week or whatever the circumstance. And so now because of because of Aisha radiallahu anha going through that experience and Ibn Taymiyyah going through an experience in his lifetime, women today can go for Hajj or Umrah and make Hajj or Umrah if you are going to be there and your period is not going to finish while you are there and you cannot extend your stay, then you can just go ahead and make Hajj or Umrah in that state. Now, there's a difference of opinion on this issue. The Hanafis, for example, say that uh, um, a sacrifice is required. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't hold that position because he says it's out of her hands. But different scholars have different opinions. Don't just take this one statement and go for Hajj or Umrah. Talk to your local imam. Get some more information. This isn't intended to be a fiqh session on Hajj or Umrah. The only reason I'm telling you this is because Aisha radiallahu anha, despite the fact that she went through Hajj with the Prophet sallam, she saw Hajj as the best jihad because of the teaching of the Prophet wasallam. So after the Prophet wasallam passed away, she wanted to go again. And then when she wanted to go again, she went to Umar anhu, who was the Khalifa at the time. And he did not allow it because they did not have a mahram. Now, when I was younger, I was invited to go on an Umrah group. I was in college. And uh, a local masjid here asked me if I could go with a youth group as kind of like a guide, like a hedge tour guide for the high school students. And at the time, I only followed the position that it was haram for me to travel without a mahram, and I didn't even know there was another position. So I asked a local scholar, what, why is it that there's a statement that Aisha radiallahu anha, that she went for hajj? Like, I mean, yeah, an extra hajj, like if her mahram wasn't there. He responded saying, well, Umar radiallahu anhu initially prohibited her from going. He prohibited her from going. So actually, she was in the wrong. That's what he told me. But Umar radiallahu anhu, if we look at the text that describe his response, he allowed her because he was convinced by the strength of her proof. He's not allowing her as the Khalifa, as the one who's responsible for an entire nation, including the mothers of the believers, who are the highest caliber amongst the, amongst the highest companion, companions. He's, he's responsible for these decisions. And so Umar radiallahu anhu, convinced by her proof, he sent Uthman and Abdul Rahman radiallahu anhumah with her to go and make hajj with the mothers of the believers. And so she had the state protection. She had the state protection. She had these great companions go with them. And the reason that I wanted to mention any of that is because in that moment where that sheikh told me, well, no, she was wrong. Umar radiallahu anhu didn't agree initially. I have thought back to that moment so many times in my life. And I thought, why didn't he tell me that Umar radiallahu anhu himself accepted her proof? Why was it she was wrong and that was the end of the statement? We're talking about Aisha radiallahu anha. Why couldn't I have been taught it's a difference of opinion? Why was I taught there's only one right answer? And that perspective, when we're looking at the woman companions, is really one that shifts our perspectives of ourselves as women in Islam. Because when Umm Haram asks to go, she could have said, well, Aisha radiallahu anha taught us that later on, even if the statement about Hajj was made later on, she could have then said, well, actually, you know, there's, a, there's a, a better form of worship. It's Hajj, and that's what I should do, which, of course, is 100% true. It's, the best, it's such, such an important type of worship. But... She never amended her desire to go. And she was 75 years old. When Ubad and Ibn Samit, they had captured the Byzantine um, ships. And for a long time, Muawiyah, 
he wanted Umar anhu to allow them to build a naval fleet. And these are people of the desert. They're not ready for a naval fleet. So Umar anhu said no. But later on, Uthman anhu said yes. And so this was the first group that was going on a naval fleet. And she wanted to go with them at 75 years old. Because years ago, she asked the Prophet ﷺ to be with that group of people. And the Prophet ﷺ told her that she will be with them. And this really speaks to the prophecies of the Prophet ﷺ also. Because in addition to the fact that he had this dream and it did come true. Because literally it could have just not come true. But it did. But she didn't have to go. It could have been her own personal decision. She might have passed away before that time. Literally anything could have happened to stop her from going. But she was with them. And it really speaks to the prophecies of the Prophet ﷺ when Fatima radiallahu anhu was told, excuse me, radiallahu anha was told that she was going to be the next one to pass away by the Prophet وسلم, amongst his family. And she was. When he told the mothers of the believers that the one with the longest hand is going to pass away first, they were measuring hands. But it actually meant the most generous one. The Prophet وسلم, prophesied who would go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala next. And every single time it was true because he's a prophet of God. So when we see that Umm Haram joins this battle, we also see that her example is not in a vacuum because her sister, Umm Sulaim, Umm Sulaim, there are multiple narrations of the Prophet وسلم, saying that he saw or he heard someone in paradise. And it was her. It was Umm Sulaim. In one narration, he mentions the footsteps of Bilal radiallahu anhu, the palace of Umar radiallahu anhu, and he mentions her. So Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha, the sister of Umm Haram, so also a relative of the Prophet sallallahu she is one of these women who has a very feisty personality. She has a feisty, assertive, aggressive personality. She's one of the women of Medina who are known to have these descriptions. And Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha, at a battle, she had a dagger. And her husband, Abu Talha, is like, wants to tell the Prophet, وسلم, like, look at my wife. <laughs> and the Prophet وسلم, is like, why do you have a dagger? And she's, she talks about how she's going to be there to defend. She's going to make sure that there's no deserters from the Muslim army. But she's there. That's the point. That she is there, and the Prophet وسلم, knows that she's there, and her husband knows that she's there, and she is present. Abu Talha, radiallahu anhu, he is the one who married her after her husband passed away. And who knows whose mother she is? Anas. Anas, the one who we have so many hadith from. The servant of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umm Sulaim was one of the first believers of Yathrib before it became Medina. When Mus'ab ibn Umayr anhu, was there making da'wah to the people of Yathrib, she was one of the first people to accept Islam. And her son, there is a category of women in the companions, and that category is called the woman who accepted Islam before their husbands. The woman who accepted Islam before their families. These are the mothers that accepted Islam and guided their children to accept Islam. She guided Anas anhu, from the time of childhood. Her husband came back after he was on a uh, like, a, like a, a trade trip and he noticed that something was different about them and he was not happy about her conversion and then he went on another trade trip and he died and she was considered to be exceedingly beautiful and she was known to be like a noble woman and so now a lot of men want to marry her and Abu Talha is like her level so he comes to her and wants to marry her and Abu Talha there is one thing that she asked for him as her mahar. Who knows what it is? Yes, his conversion to Islam. I have a lot of people tell me that their child who's in college or a young, young professional wants to get married to a man, but the man is open to converting. He's actually completely open to becoming Muslim. But they're worried that it's not really Islam because, you know, it's actually out of interest for the daughter. And so they don't want to say yes. And I just think, subhanAllah, you don't know who's, what is going to be the, 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 the moment where someone becomes Muslim, they find Islam, they accept it. Okay, maybe their role, they didn't find Islam other than through this woman, but they found Islam, they were co-workers, they're interested, 
And then they learn about Islam through her. They convert out of, yeah, it's a general, I agree with, okay, it's in general, I agree. They, I could believe in that. But they're really converting because they're interested in getting married, even though they accept the Shahada, and now they're a Muslim, and they, they may not pray five times a day. They may still be doing other things, but they generally accept it. But I've seen those people become the most committed to Islam in their families. I've seen that they are the ones who can help their spouse go from not praying at all to praying five times a day. Go from their children not caring about Islam at all to helping them love the masjid. You don't know what moment is going to be the reason someone really falls in love, not just with a person, but with Islam. So Abu Talha radiallahu anhu, he wasn't interested in Islam at first. He learned about Islam through Umm Sulaim. And she would ask him like, are you really worshiping idols? Like, are you legitimately worshiping wood? That like, if you got cold, you would break it and use it for fire? You're worshiping that? And Abu Talha, subhanAllah, is one of the, one of the greatest companions. So this woman who has this intense personality and her sister who wants to be with the group who goes in Cyprus, this, this, this household is also the one that the Prophet ﷺ would visit out of love for them. Why? Because Um Haram, even though I mentioned her husband was um, Ubadah ibn Samit, this was the next marriage she had. Her husband and her son both were killed in Uhud. They were accepted Islam very early. When Uhud took place, 70 people were martyred in Uhud, 70 of the companions. And she found that both her husband and her son were martyred. And she took it with resilience. She radiated resilience. And then her brothers, her brothers were appointed by the Prophet ﷺ, a group of 70 of, the, of those who knew Islam, those who were hafal of what had been revealed so far, were asked to go and teach a tribe about Islam. This tribe requested that they send those who know about Islam to teach them. And her two brothers went. And her two brothers were massacred in this ambush against all of the companions who had went with them, with this group. And her brother Haram, he smiled as he was being killed. And he said, I won. I won. It is said that there are people, as they're passing away, one of my teachers told me that when someone passes away, sometimes they can see the place that they're going to be or an angel of goodness that comes and gives them glad tidings. And that moment, I'm going to tell you, subhanAllah, um, when, when I was studying in Egypt, there was a woman. I had gone to the masjid so that I can ask the imam if a group of us who were Americans studying in Cairo, if we could study with this imam. And I didn't physically see him. I mean, we were like speaking through a barrier. And I asked him, like, can we study Quran with you? Because he was known to be a scholar of Quran in that region. And he said, I don't teach women. And I said, we're a group of, you know, foreigners. This, this is like access that we normally don't have in America. This is way before like anything, YouTube streams and like online classes. And I asked, can we, can we study behind a wall? We will, even if we don't wear naqab, we will wear naqab. We will sit behind a wall. We don't need to see you. But can we just study with you? And he was very respectful and he said no. And I was very sad, honestly. I just thought, subhanAllah, this is such an opportunity to study with a scholar like this. And he's not comfortable teaching women. May Allah bless him. And I didn't know where else we were going to study with Quran with someone from this background. So I went upstairs into the musalla, and there were a small group of women there. And one of the women was like, can I ask you, what, what did you ask the sheikh for? Like, it, like, I went down to the sheikh's, you know, area where there's generally there's only men there asking questions. So she was like, what did you ask him? And I was like, you know, I really wanted to study. And uh, he, sa he said, no, no. And then she was like, you were truthful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards your truthfulness. And she said, I am here because I'm going to be taking a tafsir class. And it's just for women. And she was holding books of tafsir. At that point, I barely knew any Arabic, and they were all in Arabic. <laughs> She's like, I will give you all of these books, and I will give you my phone number. And I was like, subhanAllah, may Allah bless her. And she gave me her phone number, and I met her again one more time. Um, and then many years later, when I was back 
uh, it was actually not that many years later, it was a few years later. Um, someone told me about a woman who was killed in Rabaa. She was in a hospital and her back was facing the window and a sniper shot her and killed her. And they said her name is Asma Saqr. And I was like, Asma Saqr, I know that name. But there's probably many Asma Saqr, so like. And then I saw her picture and it was the same sister. But suddenly, on social media, I don't agree that this should have been done. I was shocked to see it. But it was her picture as she was covered in the, in the burial shroud. And her face was literally this. I have never seen someone smile that wide in my life, in life. I have never seen someone with a bigger smile alive then I saw with her picture in the burial shroud, just radiant. And again, I don't agree that that should have been spread on social media. I was surprised to see it. But that moment for me, I thought of what she said. You were truthful to Allah, so Allah was truthful to you. Look at how truthful she was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how truthful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with her. She didn't live a very long life. But subhanAllah, the fact that in such a short amount of time she made such an impact on my life and the lives of the people that she knew, and that commitment to opening a door of knowledge for someone who felt like the door was closed for me in that moment, that was a moment that had I never known what happened to her, I still held that moment with such healing in my heart. When Haram is saying, I won. What kind of life did he lead? And he was Muslim for a very short amount of time. This is Uhud. He accepted Islam early. Jazakallah khairan. He accepted Islam early. He learned the Quran as much as it had been revealed. He was a half of the Quran for that amount of the Quran. And then, Fuztu. I won. This is the family that Um Haram came from. So she's lost her husband, she's lost her oldest son, she has lost her two brothers, Um Sulaim radiallahu anha, the same. And their reaction is not to say, I don't have a space in the Muslim community, or Islam only brings hardship, or every single time I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, I'm tested even more, or why isn't my dua being answered that everyone around me that I love is being taken away? All of these are very real feelings. All of us have these thoughts and these experiences. That's very human. But what do they do with it? They say, how can we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the way that's going to be the most effective and also in the way that fits their personalities? The way that fits their personalities. The great-granddaughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, her name was Sukaina. SubhanAllah, when I heard her story, actually Shaykh al-Muslim al was the one who told me her story first. And the way she told, she was like, you would, she was like, you would love her. And the way she said it was like her personality was just like so like cool. She, the people wanted to be like her. She was an influencer of her time. She made a hairstyle as a preteen. A hairstyle that became so popular in Mecca. It was so popular in other areas that she didn't even live in. It was called the Sukainiya. Like people would do it was called the Sukainiya. And she would make her hair like this really cool way. And even the men tried to do it. And then Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was the Khalif at the time, he was like, stop, men are not allowed to do this. You will be punished. This is only a woman's hairstyle. Because men had long hair at that time too. And he wanted to differentiate their hairstyles. And so when a man came and proposed to Sukaina from her dad, her father, the, the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you know what, what he said? He said, listen, Listen to her. So I told you about her, right? She has this like cool personality. She has a hairstyle that everyone wants to have. This is when she was really young. So you can imagine as she's growing older and, and people know her as this like amazing cool character with like everyone wants to be like her and Anna and, and all these guys want to marry her. And, and then what does he say? He says that her heart is too connected to Allah. She won't be able to handle being married. Like she won't be able to give you your rights as a, as a husband. Because her heart is too connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She does eventually get married. And her life is so devastating. Uh, one of the poems that she um, says is that um, to the people who murdered her, her father and then later mur murdered her husband. She said, you made me an orphan 
as a young person and you may be a widow as a woman. The, the pain that she lived was so real. And yet, when you read about her or you read the lines of poetry that she would write, her connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so much more real. That uh, intentionality of being who you are and when you face circumstances that shake you, what do you go back to? You go back to that connection, that light internally, that nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the, in the hearts of the believers. That there are going to be times that we will stumble and we will not be who we want to be. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I catch myself frequently thinking, I miss who I used to be. I wish I could be that person again. I wish I could be another person. I wish I could be better. There are times I have those thoughts where I just sit there and I'm like, when am I ever going to be who I want to become? And I know that the only reason I'm not becoming it is because I'm stopping myself. I am stopping myself. And yes, sometimes it's because of outside messages. And yes, it's just the reality of being busy with life and all of those things. But also, I, you know, it's funny because um, they say, like, you shouldn't really care about what people think about you. You should only care about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks about you. And you should care about or sees you, not thinks about you, but how he sees you and what you think about yourself. And it's like, what if you're your biggest hater? What if you're your biggest critic? And the way you think about yourself is always one where you're never worthy enough. But that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Why did he create you to be a part of this ummah? Why did he give you the examples of Umm Haram and Umm Sulaim and Sukaina radiallahu anhun? Why do we have the scholars who were women throughout our history? You know, it's a really funny statement. Um, there's a woman um, in uh, another century. I don't remember this century off the top of my head, but she is in a masjid. And she um, is approached by a man. And the man says, you woman, you come in here and you put your heads on the floor and you raise your bottoms up. Because sajda. That's what he's referring to. And, and then she tells him, just put, your, put dust in your eyes and stop looking. That's what she says to him. But then do you know what he says? He says, I can't stop looking. And do you know what she responds with? She doesn't say, well, you don't deserve to be in the masjid, which honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't have responded the way she did, mashallah. She was like, I focus more when I'm here. When I'm at home, my children distract me. And that moment for me was very powerful because she expanded on why the masjid was something, she, place she needed to be. She didn't have to do that. She did not need to give an explanation. She did not need to give a reasoning. She could have said, well, really, just stop looking. She could have just said that, and that was enough. But her giving us insight into that, I don't know what happened to this man. Maybe that conversation helped him recognize why sometimes for women with children, being in the masjid is so much more important than maybe someone in a different circumstance. But the point is that she said, I need this space. I need this space. And I need this space to be a place where I connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what impact is that going to have on her children? And what impact is that going to have on the children who see their mothers and their grandmothers going to the masjid and connected to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is the legacy that we are given. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I that those who are foremost, that they are the closest, that they are in paradise. That verse, when we talk about it, we talk about a very select few people who are part of that verse. Though, I mean, we cannot compare to Umm Haram and Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anhuma or any of the companions, or any of those who came after them. But we can follow what a companion asked the Prophet We may not have prepared what they prepared, but we love them. We didn't, we didn't prepare what they prepared. We never can prepare what they've prepared. But we love them. And the Prophet taught us that you are with the one that you love. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of the sabiqun al-awwalun, make us of the muqarrabun, make us of those who are in jannat al naim even if we know we don't deserve it. And then, even if we know we don't deserve it and we are harder on ourselves than anyone else's, and on top of that, we may feel like we're never going to be good enough, we ask Allah, Ya Allah, not because of my goodness, but because of your mercy, 
And not because of my actions, but because of my love for the people of action. Count me of those people. We live in a country where we do not hear the adhan five times a day. And we do not hear the aqama on top of that, but we still choose to pray. Or we're struggling to pray. In public places, in random places, just to make salah on time. Do you not think that the angels who are roaming the earth, who are sent to protect and make dua for you, are not acknowledging that, witnessing that, and praying for you? We're here for a reason, in this land for a reason, in this time for a reason. Every single one of us has a role to play. What that role is, we need to go back to what the woman companions did. Look at what our skills are, our interests are, our passions are, and stop denying them, and instead say, how can I use this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use this for his sake. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdikna shiru wa na ilaha ila 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 So Dr. Rania, mashallah, she's a co-founder of the Rahma Foundation. Uh, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating women and girls, as well as Medistan, a holistic mental health nonprofit serving the Muslim community. So she has uh, th this, these two roles. Um, she, uh, her research and clinical work are focused on mental health for Muslims. Dr. Awad has pioneered in founding the first Muslim mental health community advisory board uh, in the US. She's also established multiple Muslim mental health clinics clinical training programs for clinicians and educational programs for religious and community leaders that are custom tailored to addressing the mental health needs of the Muslim community. So she was this morning at a conference and then she's here. That was the, for the pediatrics, right? Was it pediatrics? Psychology? It's mashallah, not pediatrics. I thought it was psychology. I thought it was children. Children in psychology? American psychiatry. American psychiatry. I can't even keep up with this here. She was at a conference this morning. Then she's coming here. And, and then next, she's heading back to Stanford for the MSA West continued program. So for those of you who still have energy, you can follow her to Stanford this evening <laughs> for the next program, mashallah. Um, so she's at Stanford. I say that to say that she's at Stanford as well, mashallah. Uh, she's a, prof a clinical associate professor there. And um, it's, a, it's a real honor and pleasure. Yeah, I'm going to just stop there. Real honor and pleasure. But today she's going to talk about reflecting radiance. So an appropriate topic for a beautiful woman, mashallah. Let's start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. It's always an honor to be here with all of you. And mashallah, our, we were here last night, alhamdulillah, with our Friday night halakas at the Rahma Foundation, which I hope many of you will continue to join us on those Friday nights, either virtually or in person. Alhamdulillah. And for those of you who were here, how was Sheikh Aisha's takeover? <laughs> she did a halakha takeover last night. Was it good? Yes. Alhamdulillah. I'm so, oh Allahi, what an honor. And also, how wonderful for all of you to get that experience. Alhamdulillah. Today I was tasked with the topic of radiance. Reflecting radiance. And inshallah, there's a couple of stories and people that I want to kind of bring up in this particular conversation and also turn into our attention as women and as young ladies, mashallah, of what does that mean to reflect radiance? So shall we begin? Yeah, bismillah rahman rahim In thinking about radiance, one of the first people that came to mind, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'll hold this one. How about that? One of the first people that came to mind for me, and there's so many, subhanAllah, because we know that anybody who is actively worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actively reading the Quran, actively connected to the nur, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is going to reflect radiance. So I'm going to tell you the story briefly of Imam Malik. Do you know the story of Imam Malik? It's a beautiful story. How does Imam Malik become Imam Malik? Someone said it. His mom. See, so many of the biographies of the greats of our scholars, if you read into their biography, who exactly had helped them, promoted them, continued, pushed them, it's almost always the mom. And I say this to a group of many moms in the room or future to be moms one day, or if it's not biological children, then it's spiritual children and mentorship that you give to so many in your nurturing as a woman. Imam Malik, radiallahu anhu, came to his mom and said to her, came to his parents and said to them, I want to become a singer. 
Did you know this? <laughs> the great Imam Malik, who we today honor and cherish, and we quote and we love. And an entire school of Islamic law is based on his wisdoms, subhanAllah. He came to his mom when he was young and said, I want to go into singing entertainment. <laughs> and she said some really wise advice to him. She said, as you get older, your voice will change. Your face will change. And what they love you for now, this beautiful face and this beautiful voice, when you are older, they will mean nothing. Any fame and any... This one too? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's like we have had a long day. Yalla, <laughs> finish. Any fame and any glory that you will be given when you're young will fade. But if you channel that energy into studying you will become more honored. And so he thought about this and decided that maybe his mom is actually right. And Imam Malik was heavily criticized for his appearance. Does anyone know why? What is it? What, what is it? Ah, yes. MashaAllah. Imam Malik loved to wear beautiful clothing. But he was not arrogant, nor was this ostentatious. He loved, and he would quote the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you wealth, material wealth, then he loves that it shows on his ibad, on his servant. But you don't do this from a place of arrogance. You do this from a place of understanding your standing in the world. And what was Imam Malik's standing? Imam Malik was somebody who all the kings and all the greats consulted. They would visit him. They would have, they instead of him going to their courts, they would come to him. That's how important he was. And so you can imagine, if you're going to be sitting and advising People, you're going to sit with dignity. Before I tell you why I'm telling you the story, let me tell you one more thing about Imam Malik. When he would wear this beautiful clothing, and it said he would also wear very expensive musk, right? He would smell good. It said that often people would say, this must be in conflict with piety. How do you have somebody who's pious, who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala daily and focuses so much on Islamic learning, yet is, he has his beautiful clothing, he would change his clothing, often they were like pristine white, right, and musk, right, mashallah, why is he so interested in this outward form? And it goes back to his mother. When he was a little boy, a young boy, deciding to go to now study the deen, he would say to her, is it time for me to go write my lessons? And she would say, come here. And she would literally put on him scholar's clothing. Remember, he's a little kid. And she would tie his turban for him because he didn't know how to tie his own turban yet. And then she would say to him, come here and put scholar's clothing on and then go write. And so it connected for him that if somebody is going to be a person of scholarly tradition and somebody who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them either wealth or knowledge, that it should show on them. This concept, <laughs> subhanAllah, is important because many people would criticize Ibn Malik and say, what is his concern with the outward form? But in reality, we have this very funny idea that if you're somebody who is pious, if you're somebody who is dedicated to Islam, not arrogant, then you shouldn't care about what you look like. But that's simply not the tradition of the Prophet wasallam, nor the tradition of many of the greats, I won't say all, but many, who understood that actually you did have to make sure 
that you can carry this, he would say, the hadith of the Prophet, he would say, this is when people criticize him, would specifically say, the dignity of the hadith of the Prophet demands that I look this way, that I look honorable, because I am carrying the honor of this deen. And I'm working with and explaining to people this deen. How are they going to take it honorably, especially if they're people of the, quote, dunya? The people of the dunya only speak language of the people of the dunya. <laughs> and so, our teachers would tell us, if you're going to make some headway in the da'wah of Islam, and this ex explaining, teaching, and propagating of Islam, you have to be able to speak the lingo of the people of the dunya. And Imam Malik understood this. Now, all of this story is to say, when we focus on the topic of radiance, people immediately think beauty. When they think beauty, they think outward beauty. And I just gave an entire explanation as to why outward beauty is important. But it's not the kind of beauty that we talk about in conventional wisdom. And in fact, conventional wisdom today just does not count anymore. There's a lot of young people here, but also all aged people here, and I'm sure you're on various social media platforms, as I am as well. And the trends, the many, many, many trends that we see. One thing that we talk about in our girls' halakas here at Rahma is how incredibly fickle beauty is. The concept of beauty, what does fickle mean? Come on, girls, what does fickle mean? Yeah, it changes. One day it's like this, one day it's like that. If you roll back enough into history, what today is trending was once trending in the 70s. <laughs> and then it goes out, and what's trending is trending now what used to be the 60s. And then that goes out. And what trends again <laughs> is trending, right? And it just keeps on changing. And the majority of the time, who is setting the beauty, outward beauty standards? It's often men in a corporate office somewhere who decide the year before what color is going to be the color of the season that everybody buys their purses and clothes according to that. Beauty is fickle, the outer beauty. But if we want to talk about the true inner beauty, the radiance that Islam brings, I want to tell you a story of a friend of mine. I'm not a dermatologist, but she is, and a very successful one, mashallah. <laughs> Somebody who's a skin doctor, right? And when I was growing up, she was in my community. And she was a hafidh of the Qur'an, mashallah. And she was one of the first of the girls from my community to go to Syria and study. And she came back and had memorized the Qur'an and went off to medical school and became a dermatologist. When I was in high school, I shadowed her. Shadowed her clinic. She's a bit older than me, so I was shadowing her as I was learning and trying to figure out what kind of medicine did I want to do knowing that I, too, wanted to become a doctor one day. So I shouted her a few times in her dermatology clinic, and one day she said to non-Muslim patients that she was working with, and unapologetic, <laughs> unapologetic Muslim, mashallah, she said to them, she said, Muslims have the best skin. <laughs> it's like, wow, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> And then she backed it up, and she said, and you know why we have the best skin? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, these patients of hers, you know. <laughs> and she said, we have the best skin. Do you know why? Because we wash our faces five times a day. Dear sisters, it's not a judgment, but I'm just saying, the stuff you cake on that stuff that's caked on isn't allowing the radiance of what you otherwise have as a mu'min, as a believer, to come through. And it certainly prevents the water, <laughs> okay? And some of it legit says waterproof. Come on now, mashallah. Come on. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'm going to move this before I, like, knock it away. Mashallah. <laughs> I get very agitated about these things, especially when it comes to fiqh. You know this. I'm like, come on. You're going to really risk your prayers, risk your prayers by it not counting because the wudu didn't count, because of the stuff that was caked on didn't actually allow the water through. And in addition to this, and look, we counsel. I'm, counsel, I'm in the counseling field. 
And I know there's a lot of question on self-confidence that people have. And a lot of the times the reason that stuff is on there is because of self-confidence. Let me tell you, the number of women that I've met in my life, sheikhat, amazing women, scholars, who by beauty standards, outward beauty standards, would not be considered beautiful. They wouldn't. They're not like a model beautiful. But you know what shines through? You know what radiance is reflected through? It's nur. Literally, it is light. They're glowing. You look at them and you wouldn't say, nope, not, not, not model beauty, but the kind of beauty in which the nur, that light, comes through. And when you sit with them, you feel a sense of serenity and calm. You feel a person who isn't all tribulation inside of them. You feel a person who stands before their Lord at night and makes that dua and prays. And so they're holding on to the rope of Allah and the rope of Islam and nothing shakes them. Or if they are shaken, like our teachers would say, when the hurricane comes through, they would say, be a palm tree. Have you ever seen a palm tree in a hurricane? Have you? I know we don't have a lot of them up in this area. We have earthquakes. What happens to a palm tree in an earthquake? Yes. What does it do? It'll bend this way, and it'll bend that way, and it'll toss and toss, but what will not happen to the palm tree? It will not come loose. Why? Why? Because of its root systems. A palm tree's roots are deep, 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 deep down, and it's years of building. So it'll sway when a hurricane comes around, but it will not be uprooted. As they would tell us, be like the palm tree as a believer. And so when you sit with these women of nur, of light, you find that they are incredibly vibrant. You find that they're connected they're pulsating, right? literally. It's coming through. And what is they reflecting? What is the radiance that they're reflecting? It's the radiance of? Iman. The radiance of belief, the radiance of prayer, the radiance of dua, the radiance of Qur'an. Qur'an, the whole Qur'an is nur, it's light. So imagine, if you even have just one surah memorized, which all of us have more than one here, I'm sure, because we all know, at least know Fatiha, if you have at least one memorized, that is nude living within you. You are literally the vessel carrying light. And that light is reflected on you. And so when people meet you, they may not be able to tell what's special about you, but they know something is different. And oftentimes people think, oh, it's the hijab you're wearing. <laughs> Maybe that's what's different. <laughs> you know? But it's not. It's more than that. And when they talk with you, they find themselves able to actually like have a sense of calm just by talking to you. What is that? It's not you. It's not me. It's not us. It's wallahi. It's not our work. It's literally the light of Allah coming through the Quran, coming through the very beings that we have as we're reading and as we're reciting and holding on to this Quran. Which is why we have to talk about nurturing our inner selves. I joke a lot, my Halakha folks know, I joke a lot about people and their skin routines. And you should have them. I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't. <laughs> right? But I tell this funny story of one time I was, you know, Mela, forgive me, but I only tell the story because of this, uh, how, 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 how much I was caught off guard by the story. But anyway, it was one time I was, I never go up necessarily to the floor up where it has all the administrative offices, but I had to drop something off. So I dropped off something at this office, and the person working there had never met. And I was just literally just at the doorway, and I said, oh, I'm here to drop these papers off. And, and literally she turned like this, she was in one of the wheelie chairs, and she kind of turned like this, and she goes... What's your skin routine? <laughs> I was just caught off guard, like, you know, and if I had one, you know, I'd be happy to offer it. <laughs> you know? And I was like, what? <laughs> and she repeated the question again. And I was like, yeah, literally three times. And so, <laughs> and so finally, you know, I said, no, really, I don't. She's like, no, no, tell me your secret. Come on, I know what's a secret. Women have their secrets. Come on. You know? <laughs> Mashallah. 
Literally, I probably should have said to her, repeat after me. <laughs> and then I reflected on this because I walked up, I was kind of like, uh -huh, you know, like <laughs> as I left the, and I just kept thinking about this and thinking and I thought, what is going on here? And I thought, subhanAllah, even a person who's not Muslim, who does not understand necessarily or know what we mean by the radiance of Quran or of Salah or of Wudu, who knows what that was, Allah alam. Who knows, right? But I mean to say, it was something that was picked up by others. And even if you don't recognize it, it's happening, right? And you sometimes do see people, or sometimes even yourselves, often yourselves, and you can't even tell, but others can. We believe in the aura, like in a vibe, an energy that is given off by Iman. And it's tangible, and it's something you feel. And the presence of angels, and the presence of the very thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and taught us in the Quran, Simahum fi wujuhihim. Min atharin sujud. Literally, you can see it on their faces. The traces of it are on their faces from their prostration. It's in the Quran. I'm not making it up. Allah describes it directly, right? And so when we think about what, how, do, how do you get to this point, there's a certain level of nurturing your inner self, of purifying your inner reality, that that glow isn't going to get there on its own, and it's not going to get there as much as you rub stuff on it. <laughs> Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. The, the outer layer may be, but the inner glow isn't going to come until there's faith, niya, intentions, thoughts, actions, motives. Everything we do starts to become for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it appears on your face, it literally is the sign of the righteous. And look, in the tafsir, by the way, that ayah that I just said, some people, and this is not me talking, this is Imam al-Qurtubi in the tafsir, says some people interpret this verse and think that it's an outer mark. So they purposefully like, you know, press their foreheads in or do whatever they do to get this like gnarly thing on their face. <laughs> yeah, I got myself in trouble a lot. Um, Imam al-Qurtubi talking, not me. He says, some of the juhal, those who are ignorant of the meaning of the verse, believe that it's an outer mark, but actually it's an inner it's an inner manifestation, whoop, I'm excited again, inner manifestation of that nur. Does that make sense? Really important that we understand our deen. So this salah, this prayer that we do, these prostrations that we make, they are literally illumination. They illuminate you, they give you a radiance. And you are reflecting not your own work, but rather the radiance, the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in particular, I want to tell you about you know, we, I was reminding our halakai last night that we are exactly, sisters, how, how far out are we from Ramadan? Exactly one month. Last Friday, so Aid was on a Friday. Last Friday, yesterday, which was Friday, right? Four Fridays ago was the last day of Ramadan. Aid, yani. Right? You're a month out. So my question to all of you, how is your prayer? How is your Quran? How is your extra nafil and ibadah and charitable acts one month out of Ramadan. How are we doing? How are we doing? Let's just be real. How are we doing? Good. It's good to be honest. Wallahi, transparency and honesty is the most important thing. My halakha knows every Friday of the last four Fridays, I have been insisting that people take out their phones, open up their calendar, and literally put in the app, or wherever you write your calendar, uh, um, Qur'an. Let it pop up as a notification of, it's time for me to read Qur'an. Because I know my schedule, right? When I open up this app, it's very colorful, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But if it does not say, read now, Rania, I may lose track of reading that day. Does that make sense? As much as we think it's a habit, and I got this, I got this, yeah, I got this, right? The reality is life is chaotic. There's just a lot of stuff going on. And so you need to make sure that you actually pin yourself to it, and then you hold yourself to account.
If it's not daily, then it should be every few days. If it's not every few days, then at least once a week, right? There's got to be anchors to this. And if you're listening to this and you're saying, Alhamdulillah, I've got this. Alhamdulillah, prayers are good. You know, I'm able to do my nafil. I'm able to actually read some Quran. Can we talk about the next thing? Can we talk about the next thing? Like the next level? And even if you feel like that's too far, <laughs> it's okay. Our teachers tell us and remind us, you need to know what the bar is, not where you drink. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the, 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 you know, what you need to reach to. Because if you don't set the bar high enough, you're keeping it pretty low. And you're like, I'm good, I'm good. All's good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. How you doing? Alhamdulillah. 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 Who knows what that means? Right? Who knows what that means? <laughs> but if you know what the bar is, then you know that you're still striving to get there. So they would tell us the bar in terms of simahum fi wujuhihim, right? If you want that radiance, the bar that our teacher set for us, which is a hard one, but we learn it directly from the Prophet wasallam, is tahajjud. It's the extra night prayers. Now, let me tell you another story of another individual in our history who is definitely one of the most radiant women. There's two that I'll mention today, but one that I'll start with. When we think of extra worship and extra prayers and extra connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes people think of men and male worship. But I want to focus you back in that in our tradition, there is this beautiful poem written about a woman Abida, servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they say that her ibadah, her worship, outworshipped a thousand men. Who am I talking about? Rabia al Adawiya. Rabia is beautiful, subhanAllah. This is a pre Rumi, okay? MashaAllah. And she's. Her, 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 literally, her du'as are captured as poetry. SubhanAllah, how beautiful her munajat, her, 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 her kind of pleading and begging back and forth with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm going to read one to you. And it says, O oh God and my Lord, eyes are at rest and stars are setting. Hushed are the stirrings of the birds in their nests or the monsters in the oceans. You are the just who knows no change, the balance that can never swerve, the eternal that never passes away. The doors of kings are bolted now and guarded by your soldiers. But your door is open to all you, all who call upon you. My Lord, each love is now alone with his beloved. And I am alone with you. That last line especially, that every person, think about this, one is Tehashud. Three in the morning, four in the morning, middle of the, literally middle of the night. She would say almost everyone is asleep. Everyone is in the arms of their beloved. And I, ya Allah, am awake in your arms. That level of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when everything else is quiet and still, getting out of the warmth of one's bed is hard. It's hard. It's hard. I'm, I'm not going to try to <laughs> rose color it any other way. But what does it do for you? If you want to know what the bar is, right? it's to understand that if you want the radiance, you want to be able to reflect that luminosity. And we'll tell you why in a moment here. That it comes down to never missing your fard salah, your prayers, especially the obligations. And if you're good with that, to add the nawafil. And if you're good with that, try to add the extra of the night prayers or these tahajjud prayers. Because the power of the light that they give, the reflection of the radiance that something like tahajjud gives, literally it is the kind of powerful light. It's like, you know, um, Yesterday, I was telling the students at the conference, Sheikh al-Sha'rawi, rahimahullah, was a really beautiful Egyptian um, uh, mufassir of the Qur'an, somebody who explained the verses of the Qur'an, and he was also a linguist, so he really understood the meanings of the Qur'an so beautifully. And he had this really beautiful saying, where he would say that all of humanity was in darkness. And so they tried to figure out how to light up the place. He said some humans came to it by figuring out how to do, right, Light up a match, little match, a little bit of light, right? In the darkness, a little bit of light. 
Someone got smart and said, let's put the match on top of a candle. Oh, okay, now we have it's lasting a little longer, but it's still a little light. Someone said, let's take multiple candles and put them around on a chandelier. Someone said, let's put it all together and make a torch, right? The next person comes around sometime later and figures out the light bulb. Then someone says, put multiple light bulbs. Until you get all the way to where humans are striving, they're trying, they're trying to put light forward, until they built the most powerful lights there are. Have you ever been in a stadium at night? Watched a game at night? When you're in the stadium, I played sports, so today I'm like, we're in the stadium at night. When you're in the stadium at night, it is bright. It's as though it was literally the middle of the day. That's how bright it is. Bright, bright, bright light. And the point Sheikh Sharawi was trying to make is, but when the sun comes up in the morning the next day, you literally have to squint to see whether those stadium lights are still on or not. And he would say, what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, brought was like the sun compared to what all humans have attempted to put forward even in those bright stadium lights. Does that make sense? That bright light, if you want the brightest of the lights, if you literally want the nur, it's going to come from things like the Qur'an and the prayers and especially the tahajjuds. Why? Why am I pushing this as much as we can? Because I want to tell you this hadith. The Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, It's a heavy one, but it's a really beautiful one. He said, Verily, my nation will be called on the day of judgment. So imagine, just take a moment, put yourself in these shoes. It's going to come. We believe as believers, we know it's coming. But sometimes we don't think about actually putting ourselves in the shoes of what would it be like that day. So just take a moment with me. It's the day of resurrection. Yom al Qiyamah is happening. You all heard, as I heard, the stories of the chaos. The people running and screaming and shrieking and, you know, having a really hard time because the truth has come. And there's no turning back. And he says, verily, my nation will be called on the day of judgment. And they will be identified, how will you, in, 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 in millions, of, million, billion, billions of people, how are we going to be identified as Ummat Muhammad? He says, we will be identified by the traces of the radiance, speaking of reflecting radiance, the traces of the radiance from what? From the wudu. Every place that wudu touched your body, the face, the hands and arms, the feet, the head, everywhere that wudu touched, imagine. Can you imagine, have you ever been somewhere where it's like a glow in the dark or something that's a glow in the dark? Can you imagine being glowing in the dark? <laughs> I want to glow in the dark. I don't know about you on the day of judgment, mashallah, to be like, yep, that one's from Ummat Muhammad, alhamdulillah. Right, alhamdulillah. Right. I'm being very serious. This is directly from the hadith of the Prophet. ﷺ. He says they will be identified by the brightly radiant traces from the wudu. Whoever among you is able to extend this radiance, then let them do so. I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. When we start talking as reflecting radiance, my dear sisters, I'm not talking about, oh, wow, you're glowing. Are you pregnant? Right? <laughs> and yes, pregnancy does bring a glow to it. But I'm talking about a kind of glow that literally is seen, if not here and if not by the people here, is seen where it's more important. And it's identifiable and identifying you on a day that otherwise is chaotic. And on that day that you want to be identified from Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in closing and really kind of wrapping this up, remember, nur, this nur that we talk about, is a light or a glow. And when people look at you, they should see kind of a refreshing, vibrant radiance that comes from what? Our faith, 
our intentions, our niyyah, wallahi, even the niyyah, even the intention will give you nur, even if you don't completely follow through, or you were prevented from it, or you couldn't follow through on the intention you made. You're rewarded even for the intention. And then, of course, our behaviors, our thoughts, our actions, and our motives. And that one of the signs of the people who are righteous is being at peace, having a good attitude, and having contentment. The last person I'm going to share with you, who truly, her name literally is the Radiant. Who is the Radiant? Who is it? Fatima Zahra. What does Zahra mean? See, everybody says flower. Ah. She's literally called Fatima the Radiant. And Fatima, radiallahu anha, of course, the youngest of the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the only one who outlives him, but dies very soon after him. It is the mother, of course, of the grandchildren of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And lives a very pious, pious, humble life because neither she or her husband, who is whom? Sayyidina Ali, karamallahu wajhahu, even he, we say, may Allah ennoble his face. Can you imagine <laughs> the ennobled face and the radiant face? MashaAllah. <laughs> what an amazing couple. That's a barakallah. And here you have somebody who is, has a difficult life because they were both poor. And difficult, so much so that one day Sayyidina Ali said to her, can you ask your father for some help? Your father is the prophet of God. Like, ask him to uh, help us. They have four children, and she was, they were poor. He had to sell his shield, literally, to have enough mahar to pay for her dowry. And so she went to her father. She didn't find him there, so she left the message with Sitna Aisha radiallahu anha. And that night, the Prophet وسلم, came to her and said, you came to look for me. And she said, yes, I'm asking for help. What did he say to her? Does anyone know? Huh? What did he teach her? He said, in, he said, if you want, I can get you help. But if you want, I can teach you something that's better than this. And what was that? Say, say it together. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. And he taught her to say this. And in teaching her this, what was he teaching? Because it wasn't just teaching her. He was teaching all of us by extension. And this doesn't mean, by the way, you can't get help. That's not the, the, that's not the moral of the story. Some people take that and say, oh, I've got to be super and I've got to do this all alone. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is to be content, to be patient, to work through it. Because what the Prophet ﷺ is teaching, he's using his daughter realizing that she will be the example. She's, she's from the exemplars, right? The women who are guaranteed paradise. And there are so many women of this, in this globe, on this globe, who are never going to have, my dear sisters, I know you all come from different communities and walks of life, but we all collectively have what most women in this, on this globe do not have and cannot access. Do you hear me? So when the Prophet ﷺ says, can I teach you these words, it's because there will be the millions of Muslim women who can't access extra help. And how will they remain steadfast and content? SubhanAllah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. But like the original story I started off with, Imam Malik, if Allah has given you wealth, then use it. Alhamdulillah, Allah wants to see that goodness on you. But if he hasn't given that to you, and that's part of your trials, your trials, then there's other ways to hold on to contentment as well. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? This deen is for everybody, so therefore it has to have flexibility for all times and all places and all people, right? And so, back to what we were saying of Sittina Fatima Zahra, part of this is knowing that by nurturing that inner self, you're going to also be able to glow externally. And even if it does not show to the people around you or you can't see it when you look in the mirror, know that the angels have witnessed it. And know that when the day when it matters, when you want to be identified as part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that that radiance and luminosity comes through. That's what we're hoping for. Wallahi. So my dear sisters, and I'm speaking to all our young ones and to all, actually everybody here, please. The hadith clearly says, if you have the ability to extend it, then let them do. What is he referring to? Make sure that the wudu is full. 
look, as a fiqh teacher, <laughs> now people are not going to ever want to make wudu in front of me. <laughs> I hold my tongue. I don't know you, so I won't say anything. But if I know you, or if you've been in my halakha for some time, and I walk in and you're making wudu next to me and you're going like this, I will tell you, sister, unpin your hijab. Allow that water to get all the way through to the entire extent of the face, to the entire extent of the elbows. Make sure the feet are fully washed. Allow the light to shine in the dunya and in the akhirah. The splashes and the quick wipes aren't going to give you the kind of luminosity that we, we need. Did I hurt your feelings? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And so I'm going to end here, inshallah, by telling you that the Prophet Muhammad, by a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he said, in paradise there is a street in which they, could come, they would come every Friday, and the north wind would blow and it would scatter fragrance on their faces and on their clothes and would add beauty and loveliness. <laughs> That's what it says. And then they would go back to their families after having added their, this beauty and loveliness to themselves, and their family would say to them, by Allah, you have been increased in beauty and loveliness after leaving us. And they would say, by Allah, you have also increased in beauty and loveliness after us. SubhanAllah. The, the point of this hadith here is to think about how this idea of Jannah, that in Jannah, all of it is literally light, is nur. And if you feel the sense of darkness here right now, in this life that you're living, there's constriction, there's tightness, there's difficulty, there's dark corners. As a believer, know that there is ever-lasting, ever-ending, never-ending light that's coming forward. I hope, inshallah, you and I can find that kind of light in this dunya too. But if it's hard to find or there's moments or stages or years of your life in which are difficult to find that light, know that the light is coming forever after this, inshallah ta'ala. And that helps the believer breathe, <laughs> knowing that what's to come is greater and bigger and that Allah in his vastness, in his vastness, won't ever leave us alone. InshaAllah. And with that, we'll close. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ma'ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I ask you, Rabbil Alameen, that you please, Ya Allah, allow us to be women of radiance. Women, Ya Rabbi, who glow from the inside out. Ya Rabbi, whose insides match their outsides and their outsides match their insides. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to be people who are steadfast on this deen. Ya Rabbi, allow us to have the kind of light on our faces from a, the traces of our wudu and our prayers, Ya Kareem. Allow us to try to be people of tahajjud, to stand between your hands alone when all others are sleeping. Ya Rabbi, to experience that sweetness of faith so we are never ever shaken. Ya Rabbi, like the palm tree, it may sway, but it's never uprooted. Ya Rabbi, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to please bless us, increase us, empower us, uplift us. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to love us because we love you, Ya Kareem, and allow that love to enter into our hearts fully and completely. And the love of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to be able to give that love and the knowledge of this deen to our progeny, Ya Kareem, that our great great, great grandchildren in this country still call themselves Muslimin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Ameen. So we'll get through as many as possible. All right. Stada how, Hussai. Um, how, how the sister is asking how to advise uh, she says, how to advise my sister who doesn't dress modestly and I want to see her and do well for her akhirah. I want to see well, like, you know, you just want good for your sister. How can she advise her? I always have so many follow-up questions when we get these, like, is this your real sister? Are you close to her? Um, is it your friend? And a lot of those variables map because... Adina Nasiha, and we have to be very delicate when we're advising people. Um, so the closeness of the bond really does matter. Um, 
and I, I would just say continue to be a good sister to your sister. When we reflect all the virtues that we've talked about and we are loving and kind and supporting, you're definitely going to get more reception in, and if that opportunity. So, um, yeah, the, the better, the more you focus on just being a really good um, model, modeling the virtues of our faith, then inshallah, when the opportunity, if the opportunity presents itself to, for you to give advice, she will likely receive it better. But if every time you meet with her, you're just focusing on her not wearing hijab and in your heart you're kind of judging her, um, even if it's coming from a place of wanting her guidance, then you may lose that uh, opportunity to really create a bond. Um, alhamdulillah, you know, I, I have relatives who do not wear the hijab. And to be honest, it be, it's become something that I don't really focus on uh, when I'm with them. I just want to enjoy my time with them and and create that bond and I feel that over the years we have definitely built a very strong bond and there have been times where yes conversations go into different directions and I find that they genuinely are listening uh, and they want to hear what I have to say because they haven't felt judged by me the entire time that we've been friends with or I mean that I've been close to them so I would just say continue to be a good sister make and then also the other part of it make a lot of dua your dua in uh, the in her absence uh, could be the very reason why Allah Subhanahu turns her heart to wear the hijab and just uh, continue to just be a good sister. Inshallah, hijab is definitely fard, but um, it's not something that we should make as a or prevent us from feeling close to someone who doesn't wear a hijab, because everybody's on their own path. Inshallah. Uh, this question has to do with the uh, probably just like the the rule following. Sometimes um, people get uh, have questions about that. So, how important is it to pray towards the qibla, and is it important to do will do with water all the time? It, it's a valid question, so we'll answer it. Definitely, absolutely. Um, so, is it? Let, let me tell you something. In fiqh, and it's not a fiqh class today, but we're going to go into fiqh or Islamic rulings for a moment. Across all the schools, the rule is that you have to determine the location or the direction of the qibla in order for your, val your prayer to be valid. Interestingly, it means that you exert your best effort. So, dear sisters, these phones that you carry, they have a built-in compass. Yeah? And in your prayer app, it also has a compass. And I am old enough <laughs> to have carried compasses, actual compasses, with me forever, everywhere I went, in school, college, you know, <laughs> whatever, everywhere, everywhere we went, everywhere we went, right, before these smartphones happened and then we became kind of dumb and we forgot how to, like, figure out the direction of the Qibla, subhanAllah, they're right here. These compass apps, or whether an actual compass, or even better, is learning <laughs> the shadows, which is how people before compasses used to figure out the directions of the qibla and also the timings of prayer. They'd figure out north, east, west, and south. One time, I'll tell you this very quick story. One time I came, I was in an international travel and the, the, my transit was very, very short. And when you're in an airport and you have to like run from one gate to another really quickly, and I had to catch prayer right in that little tiny window <laughs> or prayer would have left. And when you come out of an airport and you're like discombobulated, it's international, you don't know where you are, it's not, <laughs> you can't even speak what the language is that's going on, you, you, you're, it's kind of discombobulating. And I thought to myself, okay, I, at the very least, I'll look out and see like the shadows. Well, it turned out that by then it was very uh, cloudy and I couldn't figure out the direction of anything, where the sun was. So I said, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, please help Ya Allah. The interesting thing is in about an airport is that people, especially in an airport, know the directions. <laughs> You know which way is east, north, and south. And I said, what is the direction of east? Help me. Just give me one. Just give me east. Do something. You know? And so, subhanAllah, as I came out of the airport, and the, the person who answered my question said, are you looking for the qibla? And I thought, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was a Muslim brother. I couldn't tell, subhanAllah. But he could see I was frazzled trying to figure out the direction of prayer. Or at least a direction. And I thought, Allah sends you people, subhanAllah. With a good intention, 
Try your very hardest. And I'll tell you a follow-up story. <laughs> One time, two of us who had taken a fifth class together were in another conference and we had to pray. And we had nothing with us to figure out exactly the direction inside of a building. It's all like close and, and it was actually nighttime. It was a night prayer. So there was no sun to exactly see where it set it, where it, you know, where it came up and where it set. And so anyway, the rule in the fifth book is you have to do your best effort to figure out the direction of the Qibla. And if the two of you disagree, each one has to pray according to the Qibla that they figure it out is the best. And so I tried to convince her it's this way. And she tried to convince me it's this way. And we couldn't <laughs> agree. We had both studied fiqh. We were both students of fiqh. And at the end, we both said, we know what the rule is. And each one prayed on our own. And it, and it counted for each person because they did the prerequisite. So I always tell people, don't walk into a room and just go, um, Allah Akbar. <laughs> you got to give some effort some effort of figuring out east, north, west, and south. Now in terms of wudu, the answer is the same. It requires a full wudu always, right? And with the few, or I say, with the few exceptions, but they have to qualify for the exceptions that require a dry ablution or tayammum. And if it does not qualify for tayammum, then a full water wudu is actually required if your wudu was broken. But if you're one of the lucky people that know how to carry a wudu from one prayer to another, some people are a ken, they don't like break wudu easily. You'll carry wudu for a little while. Otherwise, it is hard. And nowadays, in the university where I work, there's a lot of same gender, like one gender bathrooms, right? Listen, the rooms, the, the bathrooms, I mean, that have the one person stalls, and they say, for everybody, all genders. I'm like, fine. Because at least it closes the door and I'm able to use this. I use this in airports, I use this in bathrooms, in, in schools, colleges, everywhere, wherever I am. If I can find that, it's easy because you can close the door and easily make wudu. Right? And if not, then it's hard. Yes, it's hard, but it is part and parcel of being Muslim. Uh, first, Jada Maryam, um, how does one start or work on surrendering to the law and just letting go? I think it really depends on the circumstance. This is super general, and it really, really could depend on what the person is asking about. Um, sometimes people ask me this when they have a specific du'a that they've been making for a very long time, and they're wondering if the fact that it's not being answered means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't want to give it to you for whatever reason. Maybe it's not good for you. Maybe it's not good for your akhirah. Um, and so this is where they're asking that question from. I'm going to answer it from that perspective because there's no other context, and that's the the one I'm asked most. Um, but number one, recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you so much that he always decrees what is best for you. Even if in that moment it doesn't feel like it's the best thing. And I'll give you the example of somebody who, um, you know, wants to get married. I get this question all the time. Wants to get married, wants to get married. It's been like 10 years they've been making dua. It's been 15 years they've been looking and they're just looking and looking and now they're wondering, should they just give up? Should they just stop? Now they're in their mid-30s. They've been looking since they were like 20 um, and they're wondering whether or not Allah has willed marriage for them. And whenever someone asks me this question, I always ask them, do they want to get married? Is this something they want? And if the answer is yes, they actually want it. It's not something that they feel pressured into. It's not something that their parents are, you know, begging for them to do. It's something they've been open to and they've really sincerely been trying. Then I suggest that they keep asking and they keep making istikhara about, other, you know, any opportunities or anything that might open because you never know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for you. You will never lose with du'a. So if it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed that marriage is not the best for this person, then maybe he's going to open a different door. But while you're making du'a for marriage, you say, if it's best for me, open this door. If it's best for me, facilitate it. If it's best for me, give me better than I can ask for. And in the process, if it's not best for you, then Allah will give you something better. He absolutely will. You literally cannot lose with du'a. Either he will avert some evil from your life. May Allah protect everybody and everyone everyone we love, Ya Rabb. Or he will give it in the hereafter. Or he will give something better than you can imagine while you're making that dua. Or he will delay it for a better time. He will give something different. You can't lose with dua. So the first thing is just keep making the dua with the clause. If it's best for me. If it's not, then take it away from me and bring me something better. And the secondly, after that, 
what actions are you taking or not taking? I know I'm giving the marriage example, so I'm sorry if your question was about something totally unrelated. Um, but a lot of people I know are only open to marrying someone of their specific race or of their specific state. They don't want to move out of state. Um, they have to marry someone who has the same type of career background or a specific type of income level. Um, those are fine. It's fine to have those general you know, interests, but that's going to close the opportunities for a person who's looking. So what do what does the person looking and at making du'a for also need to do to open kind of like those doors? Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending someone over and over and because of specific requirements that they're just closing that door over and over themselves. So constantly make istikhara, keep your you know your your options open um, and always you know make du'a but also in the process please you know I'm really big on this I always talk about Maristan to everyone and their mom please go to therapy, you know, it, it, contact Maristan. Sometimes the reasons why people are saying no to individuals is actually not because of the other person, but because of something they need to work through. So going through therapy and navigating that is really important so that inshallah you are at a place where you can sincerely consider who might actually be good for you. So maybe it hasn't happened yet because you're not at the right space yet. Only Allah knows. I don't know. I'm told, I have no, no idea. Um, and maybe it's not meant. It's not meant for every person. And that is why we have so many examples in our history of women and men who did not marry, but who were scholars, who were du'ats, who were so involved in Islam. They could travel. They could do so much more because they didn't have the responsibility of family and in this particular way. So only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And may Allah bless every single one of you and everyone that you love with the best. Ya Rabbul Um Another one for Sada Mariam about... Um, Book recommendations, mashallah, your talk was like packed with so many interesting uh, people and figures and history. So uh, several questions actually about, you know, your reading list maybe for the recommendations. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone else if they have recommendations. I have, I generally read in Arabic only now because the sources in English are so limited. There are more and more that are coming, um, but I know a last time I said I'm done with my book. I was not done. I thought I was done, but now I'm still working on it. Inshallah, when it's out, inshallah, it'll be a resource. Inshallah, please make to offer it. It's taking forever. Um, but uh, in the book, I've translated so much because so much is just not in English. However, what I do know in English that I really recommend is Al Muhaddithat, and I say this every all the time. A L M U H A D D I T H A T Al Muhaddithat. It's by Sheikh Akram Nadawi, and it's in English. Um, and then there's also Tahrir al Mar'a is just being translated by Adil Salahi, and I don't know it's what it's called in English. What is it called in English? Uh, women's social participation or something like that. But look up A D I L. S A L H I Adil Salahi. It's a six volume book in Arabic and he's translating different volumes slowly. Um, and then there's also Reclaiming the Mosque. Reclaiming the Mosque by Dr. Jasser Auda, huge scholar of Maqasid in our time. Um, Reclaiming the Mosque. Um, and then there's one more in English, which is, help me, what's another one in English? Mm, there's one. Uh, what's, what's the Just like a, a women's issues, women's scholarship, women scholars of the past. I know there's one more that I'm missing. It's like a biography or bibliography. Not bibliography, it's a biography. I'm sorry. If I think of it all, I'm so sorry that it's... Yeah, inshallah, inshallah, all of you will be those who contribute to the literature that we desperately need in English, but it's, 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 it's getting out there just slowly. But there's definitely more that I just don't know off the top of my head. Okay, I was just thinking we, we need a book list. <clears throat> uh, for Stada Hosai. Um, I've been wearing hijab on and off for a couple of months. I'm at the point where I don't know how to answer people who see hijab as black and white. How will I know when I'm ready to commit to hijab? How long is the correct amount of time to take to make the decision of starting your hijab journey? Um, this is a tough question because what I really want to say is <laughs> don't answer them. <laughs> I mean, you know, I feel like people just need to respect boundaries. It's odd. Like, you couldn't imagine someone going up to someone who, you know, with their prayer and asking them, when are you going to do all five of your prayers? Like, just the idea of someone doing that is just very intrusive. And um, I don't know, I, I find it uh, just, um, yeah, intrusive. But I think, 
It depends on the person. And I, I would say to the sister, this is your journey with hijab. It's very private. It's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You shouldn't feel pressured to uh, rush your decision because people are putting these you know, questions before you and now you feel like you have to answer to them. No, you don't. It's your, It's yours. Own it, claim it, and you can respectfully just say, "I'm, I'm just in a transition in my life, and you know, it might take me more time, but you know, you'll know when I start wearing it all the time." But again, these are the types of questions that it really depends on the relationship you have with the one who's asking you. Um, but if you can and if you feel comfortable, I'm, I'm a big fan of being in control of your own narrative. So I am an open communicator, and if I felt like this was me, I would likely announce to my siblings, for example, or my, you know, the people in my close immediate circle, like, listen, I'm, you know, going to be, you know, wearing hijab maybe here and there, and it's a very personal thing for me, and I would love your support and dua, and I would include them in that way. If you're comfortable, that could be an option. That way they, they feel like they're partly with you. Um, but I do feel sometimes people, especially around hijab, if they don't wear hijab, they might feel uncomfortable because they don't know if you are going to continue to change and they are not, you know, in, on the same path as you. So they sometimes, I think people may put their own comfort before your comfort. And that's why you have to kind of assess the situation. What is the motive of the questioner? Are they really curious about your path? Or is it more that you're making them uncomfortable and they're just kind of putting you on the spot? Um, you know, we don't want to necessarily have uh, su'adhan or think the wor uh, worst of people. But I would just say that when questions are posed like this, it's difficult because there's so many follow-up uh, details that I think would make it easier to answer. But generally speaking, hijab is very personal, and I think we have to, as women, um, own that it is a personal decision, and somehow, in the most graceful way, let our loved ones know that it's it'll take time. And I encourage you to continue on your path, inshallah. And if it takes you months, uh, alhamdulillah. If it takes you years, alhamdulillah. But if you want to you know, really kind of have a solid plan, I would say, and I, I have advised sisters and it's worked, set a deadline for yourself. You don't have to share that with everybody, but you could just say, I'm going to give myself two months, three months, or, you know, by this point, maybe it's a personal uh, milestone for you, a, year, a time in your life where you feel like you really want to, by that point, um, commit to the hijab. And that's your personal deadline. You don't need to broadcast that to anybody. Because as soon as you do it, and, or if it, that time comes and then you're not ready, everybody's going to come and start judging you again. So I just feel like we have to kind of be very careful with oversharing. But if it's, again, a relationship where you feel comfortable, then just let them know that you're on a journey. And just like all journeys, it takes time. So Dr. Rania, how does one become an Islamic psychologist? Really? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Happy, happy to talk about it. Alhamdulillah. First of all, there's the Maristan booth out there, and you can talk to them, mashallah. Um, it's actually outside in the foyer, and you're welcome to, to chat with the folks at the table. Um, yeah, so how do you do this? So I always talk about how if you're going to put the word Islam before anything, so in this case, Islamic psychology, then it has to be something that's actually starts with and is grounded in Islam. Um, there's a lot of discussions on, you know, you know, let's kind of throw in a little bit of hadith here and a little bit of Quran here and make mental health kind of Muslim. And there is a field actually called Muslim mental health, which is for Muslim people, right, and kind of their mental health. But it's not the same as Islamic psychology. What Islamic psychology means is that, that the foundation of the actual field starts with Islam and then a psychology is derived or built upon it from Islam itself, if that makes sense. So how does one go around go about doing this? Um, it re does require, and in fact, my um, every week in Maristan, I, I teach the, the therapist, I, I go through the book, the book that we, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah we're able to finish and complete is called um, Introducing Islamic Concepts in Clinical Mental Health Care. And what that's about is basically talking about exactly what I mean. Here are the foundations of Islam and how do you integrate them into clinical care. So in that training that we're doing, it identifies and says, how do you become an Islamic psychologist? And it, has, it gives you three main things. It says, first, 
you have to be able to ground yourself in Islam, which means a lifelong journey of Islamic learning. None of us, nobody here, nobody on this panel, alhamdulillah, and none of you either, inshallah, start studying Islam and say, okay, now I'm done. The minute you say you're done is actually the minute you know everything is lost, <laughs> subhanAllah. You've got to keep going and keep going in your studies, even if it's adding little by little. So it's a commitment what, to a lifelong journey of Islamic learning. Secondly, in this country, in America, you cannot become a psychologist, a therapist, a psychiatrist, a counselor of any sort unless you are certified and credentialed by an actual program. So that's either a master's degree or a PhD degree, or in the case of a psychiatrist, an MD, a medical degree. And you need those certifications to be able to practice in this country. So, alhamdulillah, I hope, <laughs> we are having less people going around the community saying, I can be a counselor, I can counsel you. Alhamdulillah, I can give you nasiha, they can give you religious counseling or maybe some coaching, but they're not actual therapists or clinicians unless they've actually done their degrees, certifications, licensing, and exams. Right? They are, they are board exams and they're boards that govern this practice for ethical behavior and correct practice. And thirdly, the place in which you're neither sheikh nor are you, you're not a sheikh here and you're not a complete secular therapist or psychologist is that middle space of how do you bring Islam into the story and that's actually learning the ways, so it's basically the training that I was talking about. We call it the Traditionally Integrated Islamic Psychotherapy or TIIP model for those interested um, or taking some sort of diploma or course in Islamic psychology so that you can bridge your Western secular psychology training and bridge that to the Islamic training and actually learn the concepts. So there's three steps of how you become an Islamic psychologist. Um, there's a few questions about um, study advice. Um, like, where's a good place to study? People that want to memorize uh, Quran, people that want to just learn their fardain, um, make sure that they're grounded. Uh, just maybe recommendations from the panel. Obviously, the Rahma Foundation, um, but also Rabata, uh, mashallah, amazing institute. Everyone knows Dr. Tamara Gray and the work that she's doing with centering women's voices in Islamic history and what that means now. It's online, it's accessible. So between Rahma and Rabata, mashallah, we have resources we never had in the past. Also, As Salam Institute is Dr. Akram Nadawi's online institute. And if you'd like to do a higher level, um, like a series that have to do with uh, other texts that he specifically has teaches, you can also study with him. I didn't mean to say higher level, as in Robolta doesn't have higher level. They both have higher level. They're just different types of tracks. I know Dr. We wanted Dr. Haifa to be here today, but she wasn't able to join us because of her schedule. Uh, so I will say uh, Jenna Institute. And now that you've taken all the woman ones, <laughs> which is great, they're usually the ones I give first on the list, so alhamdulillah that came. Um, other places that, and I always tell people who ask me, especially uh, high school students, college age students, or anybody who is in a stage of life where they can actually take what we call a gap year, I really encourage people to take a gap year in their studies, because at the end of the day, whether you graduate at 21 or 22, no one's going to remember. Or if you go finish your graduate degrees at 24 or 25, no one's going to remember. But that one year that you spent studying Islam, right, and I'll give you some of the names of the seminaries in just a moment here, is going to make a massive difference in your life. So I really encourage people to literally pause for a bit and take a gap year if they can, inshallah. And if you can't, then do the programs we're talking about here. At Abata, you take one course at a time, one course at a time, like a semester, right? You can, every woman in this room can literally add a Rabata course in their year. Every woman can do that. Also, Jenna Institute does something called the Year of Knowledge, so you dedicate a year to learning the foundations of your deen. The other seminaries that are both online and in person is the Qalam Institute, which is based out of Texas, and that is can take you from step one, literally, literally alif ba ta, literally, literally letters, alif ba ta, to full-on five-year alim alima program. I was visiting them in Texas just a few months back, and I went into the beginner class. They said, this is year one. They said they started in, so I was visiting in November. They started in September with the academic year. They said, these students here only knew Alif Ba'ta when they came, and they could only recognize the alphabet. And I said, what? Because I'm standing in the back of the class, and they are literally legit reading text. <laughs> and I'm like, how in three months did you get people going from Alif Ba'ta to reading? It's amazing, right? But that's what happens when you dedicate to like a strong, good program. So I encourage you to look out for Qalam and do a virtual or you can do it in person in Texas. 
And then you can also, if you have a year, go to Taysir Seminary, that's in Tennessee. Ustada Zainab Ansari, who's one of our dear teachers and beloved friend of ours, is the resident scholar of the Taysir Seminary. So a woman, mashallah, a resident scholar. And it's a year-long program in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I'll add those two to the list as well. Taysir. Taysir Seminary. You've said them all. <laughs> like, no, she wants to spell it. I can't think of any others. Those are all the ones I was going to say. As well? Yeah. Oh, we forgot Zaytuna, of course, of course. <laughs> which, which is in our neighborhood. Yes. Mashallah. If you're hoping to do a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, of course, here in Berkeley, uh, it has to be in person at Zaytuna College. Um, Taysir is spelled T-A-Y-S-E-E-R. Taysir Seminary. Mm -hmm. That's in person in Knoxville. Qalam is the one that has both. And another one, if you want to send your kids uh, in person, is Miftah. I think a lot of you have heard about Miftah. They were in this masjid before, and they're in Michigan. And they have a full-on boys program and now a girls program as well. But they're um, in-person uh, program. Um, Did we forget something? Yeah, the earlier ones we said. Yeah, the earlier ones, yeah. Yeah, Rabata Jada Institute, uh, Friday Night at Rahma. Come Welcome. here, Friday <laughs> Night. <laughs> um, this, one's, this one, is, I think, speaks to our time. If a Muslim man who is not responsible, hasn't been a provider, doesn't take a leadership role in making the kids religious or anything else in the household, but is otherwise a good man, is that man still superior to his wife? And does the hadith about his woman not being grateful to him still apply? And that's first other Maryam. <laughs> so there's a difference between fiqh and relationship advice therapy. Fiqh is law, it's dry. It doesn't look at what are the dynamics of this. If you say this and he responds in this way, also actually it does mention some of those things for some rulings. But it's not going to say, um, respond to him in this way and then his heart will become soft, and then your heart will become soft, and then you're going to fall in love more. And Filk doesn't deal with any of that. It's law. So from a dry legal perspective, if a husband is not financially providing fully for his wife, it does impact Filk. It absolutely impacts the rulings of the rights that he receives. But I'd like to go back to the end of the question, which was something like, does that mean he's superior to his wife? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make the husband or the wife superior to one another in his sight. Both of you are equal in his sight. There is a level of responsibility that the husband has over the family and over the wife and the, um, and the, the questioning that he will be asked as a shepherd or as the leader of the family um, and, the, and the way that he makes uh, decisions that will impact the whole family with the support and the guidance and the um, and the discussion of his wife and his children and the family. Now, there are going to be men and women who are abusive, who abuse their trust, who abuse their roles and their rights, including two children. And there is a legal system in place for when that takes place. But if we're not talking about abuse, we're just talking about he's a good man, which is what was mentioned, but he doesn't take care of financially providing. He's not um, you know, in the role of a, of a spiritual leader, which is, I think, what the question was alluding to. Then and really, in today, if, you, if you're asking this question and you're not, you're in California and you can't go to an Islamic court system and you're asking what to do, there's two things I would recommend. One, go to therapy. If you cannot go to therapy with your husband because he doesn't want to go or he refuses to go, go on your own. Um, it's very important that you go and you seek what you can do differently or what you just need to hear if for yourself and how that may or may not change the dynamic. So you going to speak to a professional is really key. That's much more important than you hearing, asking and me, me who is not a professional in um, anything related to clinical science or relationships or marriage therapy, any of those things, answering this question on how that's going to impact your relationship. Please speak with a professional. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this is a very general Q&A. Your specific situation should also be discussed with a person of knowledge. If there's an imam or a sheikha that you trust, Dr. Rania herself, go to them and speak and ask about the specifics of your dynamic and seek advice. Because it sounds like you're saying, he's a good man. That's not someone who you're afraid of. It's just maybe he's not giving you all of the rights Islamically. And the third is looking at the rules of fiqh. So one, if he is not fully financially providing for you and you are contributing to the household, there's a few things that happen. 
One, scholars discuss that he no longer has the right to certain rights that he receives due to, due to giving that provision. But again, when I say scholars say, I'm not going into all of the details. Scholars say is a huge statement. Which scholar? Which medhab? How does the medhab look at that issue? This is not the place for that longer discussion. I'm just giving you generalities that there are scholars who discuss whether or not the provision happens, how that impacts his rights. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you decide that you are going to contribute to the household, yes, it is sadaq from you because you are not required to do it so it's sadaqah from you but some scholars also say that he cannot accept it as sadaqah and it has to be a debt that he has to pay you back and so in that case you would need to write a contract that at some point he would need to repay you if that is what you're asking for so these are just interesting ways that Islamic law looks at this issue I'm not I'm sorry this isn't the place for like a long fiqh discussion on it I guess the, the, the minor point is you have rights and Islam recognizes your rights. Two, the mentality that he is somehow above you is, is unfortunately something that is absolutely seeped throughout Muslim, you know, many Muslim thought uh, mindsets. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the honor and responsibility on both individuals in a marriage. The issue of who is going to make the final decision with certain aspects or who holds the more who holds more weight in terms of responsibility um, is one that of, of course is a discussion within um, Islamic law, but also that falls on are they fulfilling their rights, the rights and the responsibilities that they have in a household. And finally, please make sure that you speak with professionals. And I'm actually should have passed this question before even answering it to everybody else. So. Yeah. Like, I feel, Let me fix I feel like no. Did. I feel like you did such an amazing job. Literally, was what I was going to add was not exactly professional because it's like that's the first step but the but I just wanted to add one more thing it was actually related to dua which is something we talked about earlier in the questions but I just want to tell the sister who asked this and any sisters who have a similar question or something else that they're dealing with similarly please don't underestimate the power of dua remember that people are what you when you see them right now or in the years that you've known them these are also stages or seasons of life and people do have the propensity to change Allah is so gracious to us, he allows for tawbah, <laughs> repentance, and kind of coming back all the time. And so we, we hope that the person you're asking about is somebody who sees the light at some point, right, and is able to actually change. And the reason why we would tell a sister to really, if a person, if a man is good to her, a husband is good to her in every other way, of not just sort of walking away from it, is because if he has the propensity potentially to change, this could be a very powerful and wonderful marriage, potentially even though right now in this season, it's very difficult. And so the reason I say that is because we have counseled women, subhanAllah, and I sometimes share this, some of you have heard these stories before, where year after year, we see them in women's conferences, and they have very difficult things happening at home. But how many times have I had a woman, subhanAllah, who I've met year after year after year with very difficult circumstances, and I would say, dua, don't underestimate your du'a. Make sure you're taking all the steps, the counseling and all the steps we talked about, but don't underestimate the power of du'a. And how beautiful is it? And this has truly happened. Like it's a real thing that I've experienced in a women's conference like this, where after several years, subhanAllah, she came and said, my husband is here. Here he is. Alhamdulillah. He's turned a corner. He's turned a new leaf in a new chapter in his life. Something happened, and subhanAllah, sometimes there are hard things or bad, bad things. Nothing's ever bad with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sends us sometimes heavy things to wake us up, right? But they woke him up out of the stupor he was in, subhanAllah, and he turned a leaf. And I think that's really important, subhanAllah. So just just give some hope and advice that our teachers give us, alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, many of the women who mentioned studying overseas, um, getting, you know, but there being more barriers to travel and study now, even in the countries that were named Syria and, and even Yemen, uh, the difficulty to go there now because of the situation. But in the Bay, mashallah, where there's so many different programs, there's still uh, uh, the issue of access. Like, not everybody knows about the classes, not everybody is able to come here. So, uh, what can we do to sort of connect? Um, they mentioned the inner city youth. Uh, children that are coming, girls that are coming from uh, immigrant families who don't necessarily have transportation or uh, just their locality doesn't have classes. I can just, we're, we're trying to branch out. So what we're doing currently is uh, we're working with a group of uh, sisters who are being mentored as part of our Friday night program. The pre-class, our teachers do take a class. Uh, right now they're taking with, with Dr. Rania for, to mentor their teaching. And then um, they're running their own halakha 
um, in Oakland. So we, we do have that on the radar. It's something that we've done in the past um, in different communities and we want to expand because we, we know that access is difficult in terms of um, you know, families coming to Pleasanton, especially on a Friday night. We all know the traffic, it's just traffic situation and such. So it's just definitely something on our radar. I want to just uh, answer that question. Oh, where, did, where did Suzanne go? Did she run? We got to get her back. Um, there are some questions related to uh, what about nail polish? Do, um, uh, the other of uh, like fit like, uh, questions. And I would just say, Th those type of questions really need a course of study because there's a lot of what ifs to your ibadah and the best thing, the best advice is just to complete a program so that when you stand in your prayer, you don't have to deal with doubt and then you focus on the being mindful in that ibadah. So um, I would say that and then.